Our guest on this episode of the podcast is an absolute savage. We had the pleasure of interviewing a couple of his buddies in previous episodes. They all recommended that that we have him on and have him in for for a conversation, and it was awesome. He uh, he's based out of Newport, Rhode Island. He has a charter company of his own, Newport Sport Fishing Charters. Uh, focuses a lot on tatog and striped bass in the the early season and transitions to to bluefin tuna later on the season and into the fall. We had a lot in common. He is absolutely hysterical. His beard is legendary. Tons of great stories in this one. The stories of first canyon trips, you know, epic trips, slow trips, scariest things he's seen out offshore. The whole gamut. It was it was awesome. We definitely want to have him back. And we think you guys are going to think this is a great conversation. So without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, Captain Rob Taylor from Newport Sport Fishing Charters. Welcome to the Sea Bros Fishing Podcast, where we follow three words of wisdom. You can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last, you'll just have to keep listening. Stay tight. Bro, we need like a little sheet. Minimal roofies in here. Nice. We need we need like a sheet for this window for morning podcasts. Look at him right now. His beard is like glowing. That's like the bottom four it's inches. Like a, he's glowing. like God, dude. It's like it's mental. <laughs> oh, get Riley's bed. So have you been fishing at all? Dude, I've been hitting holdovers between the ice holdovers and open water in Rhode Island. I've been fishing almost every day. Really? <laughs> yeah. I literally have to make a point to get out at least, if not every other day, every day. Like yesterday, I got one bass, but I only fished for like 20 minutes because it was actually too cold and I didn't feel like putting my waders on. So what's the deal with holdovers? Dude, how, we, how the hell are you catching holdovers? We got some really good holdover fishing between, you know, like the Housatonic in Connecticut and stuff like that, or some of the backwaters in Rhode Island. We actually have a pretty decent population of holdover striped bass, and they actually get to be fairly big. You know, like we got a couple the other day that were, you know, over 20 pounds. Those are no fucking shit. Nice fucking yeah. fish or holdovers. Yep. That's sweet. And what are you what are you doing to catch them? Are you like, is it slow stuff? Is it honestly a lot matter. of reaction bites? It's it's yeah. like uh, I got these SP minnows, and then I have like sticky lead strips, so that I have different like either perfectly suspending slow fall or slow rise and then depending on the day yep. it's all reaction bites oh she's on now i can't tell you how excited i've been to fucking sit down and have a conversation with you Dude, we've heard a lot about you all pretty much good things yeah i, I think, think all good things all good things yeah yeah We've nothing you're nothing too crazy. Well, I mean, some of your Instagram videos are absolutely hilarious. Yeah, we I know sent the one this morning of you basically making out with a uh, tatog. The tatog, yeah. I some was... people blame COVID on that. <laughs> 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 oh god, that's awesome. You guys have a silly tatog fishery. Oh, it's all unbelievable. It is. I mean, that's. It's funny. That's the first thing that books up in my charter season because basically, when the clients get off the boat, they want that same day. So you know, I know exactly from October fifteenth to December fifteenth. That's booked right at the end. That's sweet. That's sick. That's yeah, a we're, nice we're, clean we're up jealous. at the end of the season too. We oh, don't yeah. really. You know, we don't get them up. We have them by us but it's not like yeah they, it's funny because i wonder how many are out there because uh one of my good buddies is up in gloucester mm-hmm. and he shoots some pretty big tog spear you can fishing, spear them but they don't eat right same yeah. thing he said yeah. he's like i haven't figured out how to catch them rod and reel but on the uh, south side of the jetty he shot tog and this year trigger fish 
No really? shit. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah, cool. we, we used to spearfish tog a lot in high school. Off Situate, Third Cliff. Yeah. I have gave Brant Rock a try, you know, yeah. when I was up there in September, and I caught nothing but giant joggies. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. So There's some decent tog, though. Like, both to your point, I've never yeah. caught one on a hook. Not, like, sized enough to make out with them, though. No. Those things are big. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was... So, that was... And the funny thing about that video is it was during a tournament, and I wanted... There was, like catch and release prize and this lady had driven a uh, drew rather this beautiful tog portrait i wanted it so bad <laughs> and i don't really get a lot of time to fish so what you don't realize also in the video is it's a nor'easter it's blowing yeah, oh, 40 it's knots so i'm we're fishing in 35 feet of water and i have 428 feet of scope out so i can hold <laughs> <laughs> so we would only the swing was so bad that we were only over the spot we fished for two hours i think we were only over the spot for 15 minutes because you had to time it you know you were coming by and you're like oh i already drop it and you're like letting line out hoping for the bite yeah and so that's incredible dude that's, that's incredible. so funny uh so we have some rapid fire questions for you we always start these off usually we try to start them off with some rapid we fire. go on tangents yeah if it evolves into a massive topic of discussion perfect totally cool all right um you go first i'm just gonna go random yeah S circle hooks or j hooks circle hooks specifically tuna fishing what kind of circle hook super mutu 12 -0. Oh, Jesus. What are you fishing with? Bluefish, I'm assuming? Well, or that's my pogey hook. I, I use yeah. the really big Mutu. You can get them up to 16 -0 for bluefish. So either the 12 or 16, depending on how big the bluefish is. Wow. 180, 150. Yeah, always 170 Premier. That's a fucking big hook, but I, that is surface baits and stuff, though. Yeah, but the bluefish are like almost nine pounds True, so yeah. you have to like it hides and even with a pogey a pogey is like this big yeah you get you know? big ones there we had kind of medium small ones and if they're healthy and tight like that hooks yeah like hidden well you know? some of the ones that i was getting in plymouth when i was coming up here were pretty big and i always just put a 12 all because even if like it wasn't big even a, on a macro like a 12 all it just kind of like lays down yeah. yeah so you don't like see it so i'm not worried about like the size of the hook being too big Cause I don't even I don't even black out my crimps. I'm I'm that guy. Yeah. <laughs> just, just well, I noticed with like the pogies, they're always kind of swimming fucking awkward and weird. So it's like it makes sense. They're always like swimming away instead of like right. macro where they just kind of dig. So Unless they, they're you know. super fresh from that point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Then they're tight on your leader and they swim nice like a mac. The twelve o has just done me right so many times because it seems like if I go like nine o, then I start to get into the gut hook world. And like, you know, we get them still, but yeah. the 12 -0 is like, if I get 10, 10 bites, nine of them are like perfect and one is like gut hooked. Right. Yeah. But the other thing I found and I've noticed like, is that the 12 -0, I've I've seen it pull and it has a better shot of re-catching because the gap is just so much yeah. bigger. Hmm. So it'll drag and sometimes it have you lucky. Have you ever snapped a tip on the 12 -0s? I haven't. I think that's smart. I heard that like the eights are really the ones that snap. Yeah. Well, it makes I haven't sense. I heard much with sevens or makes sense of it. Tens. Like latch wraps, like a hundred incher. Then yep. you, you, it's putting so much fucking pressure from Twisting the barb to pressure the tip. Too, kind you of, know, yeah. and like I just the rod's always at strike anyway, so I'll just wait until it just drag goes. You yeah. Know, keep it all the way at thirty five pounds, and it just gets in there. I, like I know the 16-0 is funny, but it, it works, man. That thing, and when you get them on that... They ain't coming off. All the way up. Like, it's like <laughs> yeah. a swim hook. Exactly. That's sick. Have you ever caught a fish with your beard? <laughs> I, I, I have. So <laughs> I went fishing, and we were, we were fishing, trout fishing, and I had brought only small jerk baits. Yeah. And then they were eating flies... So I had some like I happened to have a couple panfish jigs with me, but they were just bare jigs. So I I trimmed some of my beard and just took some <laughs> two pound tests, and I made a small fly, and I was able to actually catch brook trout, you know, stock brook trout on the beard fly. What? That's unreal. Yeah, and I I tried it first with hair, 
yeah. didn't work because it sinks too fast. The beard is coarse, so it actually helps it float a little bit better. Yeah, it's wow. like bucktail hair. Yeah, it it flares. Yeah, so. now that you say that, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. Like if you look at you look at them quick, mm. it kind of just looks like an all in one feature, right? It does, but then you look close, the texture. Yeah, different. the textures are different. Yeah, the hair is luscious. I'd have beards to, coarse. I'd have to use my pubes, dude. It's like, <laughs> it's like it's like the only thing I got going. Like either nose hairs or pubes is all. Oh I got. my god! You know, like, make a little nymph out of my nose hair. Maybe make a little like you know, clouds or minnow or something out of my pubes. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be able to do that. If we keep it well trimmed. You know? yeah. Manscape. Yeah. Christ. Oh god, that's amazing. Um, have you ever had a poop bite? Poop bite. Yeah, like you're taking a poop and you get yes. a bite. Yes, on multiple, depending on the fishery. Definitely been sitting back there and had to hold the bucket and reel down and then just sit there for a while. <laughs> so I've also had one. The best one was sometimes like you know how you know how it is when you're tuna fishing with clients and sometimes yeah. they have to they go to sleep and they take naps because you know there's that little slow. Right. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh, I gotta go. And I'm like, you know what? I get this great idea. I'm like, Bo. I'm going to go up on the roof and I'm going to take a dump up there because I won't blow out the cabin while everyone's sleeping. So I'm sitting there and then, you know, it's flat. You know, we're in the bay and I think a whale watch boat went by and I I didn't even think about it. And then all the chaos happened at once. Literally, I'm sitting on the bucket, kind of just looking out. I see the far rod go. Balloon goes down. We get the bite. Then the ferry weight comes and I'm still on the bucket. So I'm sliding back and forth on the roof. Oh. Trying to get down. Yep. Oh, that dude. and then commercial bass fishing on the backside. You know, remember that year when like uh, all those bass were in Chatham and it was all the vertical jig bite. Everyone yeah, sitting yeah. there like Old this. Jig bite, yeah. And like I was at that time, I was fishing in my center console with open boat. And like when you had to go and it's such close quarters, like there's nowhere to hide on my boat. Yeah. I'm like, so just sit down and just keep jigging. And it's fucking unbelievable. I had, I've had one bucket poop bite, but most of my poop bites have been on the actual head. Yeah. yeah. No, nah, because I'm, I'm, even though we do have a head, I tend to, I go for the bucket. Well, you're still in the action, you know? And there's something liberating about taking a shit in an open air environment. Yes. Yes. It is. You know? It's true. One thing I haven't had happen is a down rod pee bite. Uh, I can't I say I've been either. there either. And I pee a and lot. Think of how many times you're back there and you're like, I'm going to take a pee next to the down rod. And you're like, that thing's going to snap. But it hasn't It hasn't happened to me mm-hmm. yet. Yeah. Maybe someone had listening has had happen. <laughs> I bet. Dude, this is going down the rabbit hole. I love it, though. <laughs> That's what This is what it's truly all about. Yes. You know? Uh, do you want him to... Do you have any more rapid fires? Oh. I mean, I got, got, you got the other you, one. I have one, but I, I, we should wait till later for it. The whole, what do you want to do with for a week? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to kind of go into a little bit of like what your business is, kind of how it got started? Sure. A little bit of that. So it's I kind mean, of boring for some yeah. people, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, it's I, good. I run Newport Sport Fishing Charters, right? So it's a charter company. And it kind of got started is I... You know, I was big in the surf fishing, and then obviously as it progressed from surf fishing, then you get into the boating, and then you get into like offshore and all that. And it's, I love fishing so much. I mean, as you guys saw, I got I'm, my, all my gears ready to go and fish after this. So <laughs> there isn't another job that I can have where I will be successful other than fishing, mm-hmm. right? Because I I just love to go fishing. So now I get to take people, and we fish. So we started that. I mean, damn, let's see. It's been almost 12 years now. Wow. You That's know, awesome. We've been doing it. Yep. On on second boat. We're on boat number two. And uh, yeah, we run basically, I mean, we hammer out a lot of inshore charters. So, I mean, a, a majority of our fishing is, you know, whether it's Tatog or striped bass. And then as we progress through the season, you know, depending on what's going on, we'll do a little bit of offshore mixed in. And then September is tuna month. That is for for me, because sometimes, you know, as you guys know, in chartering, the grind as a charter captain, and I know that, okay, I just got to get to September, and then it changes, and then all we do is tuna fish. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then when we're done with that, comes back, and it's tall. And your September tuna fishery, with that focus, I'm assuming you're, like, fishing commercially, slash, that's, like, your hardcore clients. That's like- right. Yeah, it takes a special client to 
target giants. So it's like you almost have to be vetted, right? Yes. Like it's like, okay, you know, we've done some shark fishing and some striper fishing and I get to know you, you get to know me. Like, are we good on the boat for 10 to 12 hours? You know, because, you know, I, I'm a sunrise to sunset you know, if that's you really should takes. be saying sixteen to seventeen right. hours, because <laughs> I've heard a few people that have fished with you, like Costa Joe, who seems to just have like a fucking he's snake, snake he's snake bit streak of bad luck. Oh yeah, but he's like Rob Taylor kidnapped me. Oh yeah, that's it. It 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 does happen. But see, he was just there one day too soon, and I tried to tell him, dude, if we need to fish to do this, you cannot giant fish one day and expect results. Do two days. I know, because one day. It's who knows, it's always a variable. And then the next day we got the bite, you know? Yeah. And for us, it was the opposite. The day before we were hand feeding. And yeah. then the next day we yeah. were like grease calm 200 boats. Yeah, it was brutal. But felt bad for him. Yep. It'll happen, Joe, if you're listening. Yes. So September tuna, yep. pivoting to October. Yep. And then once that, we get into blackfish and then we take that through the home stretch. You know? I mean, it, and it's. It's good because I have a, a variety of clients now that I've been doing it for so long. So it's like I almost know who's coming and when. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like I, it's most of our business is repeat. So I see the same people, same times a year, which is awesome. And I mean, I got a depending on the fishery, I, I get a, some people that are new. So like a lot of that striped bass stuff, it's how people kind of cut their teeth into it. And it's cool. They kind of get on with the program that we do because it's mostly light tackle. But like when it comes to like tog fishing, fishing some of my clients dude these guys are killers really oh they're good that's they're good they make my day easy yeah. that's kind of yeah. why it's nice that that's how you end the year yeah because it's a less stressful totally fishery. you can just focus on your job and they're, oh, yeah. they're good anglers totally. and that's awesome it's nice having clients on the boat that you can trust that you're not like not that you're yelling at people yeah no, you just you, know, you have to you watch them have their, to talk as yeah much. for their safety you know remind them things stuff right and they get it they know the highs and lows too typically mm -hmm. they know yeah. when it can get really good and you don't lose your voice gets, on those trips yeah you know what what would you say your like makeup of clients is is it mostly new england is it people from all over the place it would be mostly new england pretty much from i would say jersey to to in the main area where a bulk of it being new jersey new york actually is, is they come up and fish with me the most yeah. we do have i do have some local you know rhode islanders that come fish but most of them are you know out of state few guys from mass and then you know some from vermont some from maine yeah did you see more local clients in and around covid like people Kind of waking up to what what they have in their own backyard. Sort of, I did, you know, and more families during that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I think it was, and that was good because it's you need new clients. So I saw more younger people coming to fish during COVID because a we were one of the only activities that was open, right? So yeah, I'm like, hey, let's go. Yeah, you know, let's yeah. fish. But I still a lot of my clients still traveled to anyway. Yeah, we saw the same pretty much. Yeah. Um. So when you got, so I kind of want to talk a little bit about bass fishing because we've seen it on, you know, I believe you did it on, was it on the on water, water the episode. Live, live chumming. Some of that, that stuff cool. too. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Tell us about kind of, do you call them pogies, bunker, Manhattan? What pogies, do you call them bunker. I call oh, them pogies. I'm a pogie guy. So the pogies down there, what's it like? I mean, I, we haven't fished down there. It can, but, it can be super thick because like the, they just all funnel into the bay. So you, you have like. Rhode Island is one giant crazy bay with so many nooks and crannies. So like when those pogies come in, I mean, they're in some serious piles. Yeah. So it can be easy, but at the same time, for whatever reason, it can be frustrating. You can go from having all the bait you need to the next day, where are they? And they're sitting hmm. down in the channel in like 40 feet. Yeah. Yeah. Are you, did you find any kind of secret ways to get them when they're that deep i still throw the net do you yeah. heavy heavy cast net yeah what net do you like uh i got a tim wade net so this guy in florida so pogey john who is another pogey guy down in rhode island and actually he provides a lot of bait for people you probably see him he goes up to plymouth he's all over yeah i know yeah him. yeah we got pogies from him one day yeah 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 we caught a fish that day with his pogey we did with his pogey was yeah, it a dead, a dead one a dead, yeah. <laughs> a dead <pogey. laughs> yeah yeah johnny so 
It's uh, he's t- turned me on to Tim Wade Nets, and it's just a custom made Tim net. Tim Wade Nets. Yep, town of Florida. I can give you his number actually, if you want to. He makes it's a mean net, you know, but it's two pounds per foot, hmm. so it's super heavy, you know. And I just throw a ten footer, nothing crazy. I do have a twelve too sometimes if they're if they're real deep, but yeah, we just use what the Betts mullet net, mullet net ten footer. So how much heavier? We're just kind of getting into the cast net thing last year, just because the pogies were thick enough really to do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, the guys in Duxbury and Plymouth kind of have always done it, but, oh, yeah. you know, being up and situated, it's a 12 mile run to kind of get into those pogies. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, I mean, that's literally, or right. even to go into Boston, it's t- same, same run distance. basically. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, like, what do you see as a difference versus, you know, that bets net versus that Tim Wade net is the Tim Wade just much heavier. It's got a, and it's got a bigger stretch and it is, I mean, cause a lot of nets, you know, you're looking at like maybe a pound and, and like a quarter per foot, you okay. know, or even like a pound and a half, but having that straight two pound, I mean, using side scan with that, you know, being able to see the pogies in the channel with the side scan and chuck the net out there, you know, you can watch it and yeah. know that I'm going to get them in 40 feet. I mean, sometimes I've, I've cast net pogies offshore in 100 feet of water. Wow. Because the net will grab them. So if they're on the surface, you run up next to them, throw the net, and they start to go down, but the net will catch them. They can't. Hmm. They can't escape. Yeah. Especially if you got a big enough pile. Yeah. They probably want to stick together. The uh, the side scan was sick. Like we we have it on the on our smaller oh, yeah. boat, and it's like a game changer with totally. pogies, especially when you get into the shallower water where they kind of get spooked a little bit. Yeah. Even with tuna, it's sick. With it's bass, so nice. unbelievable. Bass at the race on the pot line, it's an absolute game changer. It is they stick right out. Yeah, yeah, yep. You use side scan a lot, all the time. It's always running. Yeah, constantly. So what are you doing when you see these pogies? I'm always interested in like how people try to catch them. Is it? Do you have you found any kind of major tricks or advantages and like getting them yeah cast I, mean, netted. I spin them up you know you? I, i'm driving from my rear station so i have the net already loaded to go because you know i'm driving and throwing the net yeah or sometimes during tuna season i'll have bow drive and he's my mate during that time because i always take it what a sick name Bo, yeah. Bo, that's I mean, a you great slay, that's a great fucking mate name you slay giants <laughs> and probably women yes yeah. He does actually. I'll, I'll, say, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you a good woman know. story. An offline story. Yeah, I love yeah. offline stories. So, but yeah. And so it's when I'm driving like by myself, let's say we're in Rhode Island, you know, having the side scan, I mean, I have a big 15 inch display. Mm-hmm. So I'll go, once I see him, I'll touch it, make a waypoint because I have it split screen. So now I know instantly the waypoint. I'll loop back around and then I'll kind of start my approach a little faster. And it's just, I'll speed up to it, and then I'll watch. As soon as I start to see, like, one just on the on the side scan, I know I got to throw it right away because it's yeah. going to already start to go by. And then once I throw the net and it's deployed, it's hard reverse, you know, back trying to drive them into the net. Hmm. Just kind of corral them. Have you extended your, your line so that you could... So it has, I have 35 feet on it just, just to start. And then yeah. if they're in the channel, I'll go... Yeah, that's one thing we need to do another line because we were trying to spin on them last year what you're saying and like we're getting some but i just found we couldn't like we'd go in reverse and the boat would just shift off them too much i'm already starting to tighten that's not even pancaked on the bottom right yeah i'm already yeah yeah, exactly because the hardest thing is when you're doing all that driving keeping you have to have perfect slack in the net because like as soon as you get a little resistance it starts to yeah it starts Hmm. to curve up what um what about bait health like trying to keep them as green and slime layer on oh yeah that's that's like important any, any I tricks mean, like big li- big live well yeah. I, I made my live well myself so it's a custom live well so when i mo- made the mold i mean i can sit inside of it like a hot tub that's sweet you know it's it's 49 inches long it's like not super deep but it's probably like two and a half feet deep and like another two and a half feet wide gotcha you know and i have a lot of flow that's sweet 3800 gallon per hour pump that's awesome you know i mean obviously in handling of baits you know when you cast net like a lot of times if i stuff the net with pogies i can't pick it up and physically you know put them in the in there but i have carpet you know down i always have carpet so i can just get them out shovel them and get them in there quick. yeah have you noticed them not lasting as long like color wise when you cast on them versus snagging them and 
No, you know what? Cast and Ethicum, they seem to do really well. In fact, yeah. you know, in even transferring them from after to a bait pen, when I cast net them, I, they do all right. Yeah. You know, and it seems to be better if I get like 100 or less. When I get those throws where I get like 250 or so and like it's, you, you're smushing some. Then, yeah. So you kind of try to pick like the best ones and just throw the rest back. Yeah. yeah. You know, or save them for chum. Now I just save them for chum. Yeah. <clears throat> That's a good segue there, chumming. Tell us about your your live chumming approach. Oh, man. So that's where the side scan comes in, and it is freaking awesome. I mean, look, live chumming's not new. They do it in Florida all the time, and I'm like, dude, why not do that here? (laughs) So it just just happened one day. I was just bored, and it was He's got a little bit of me in him. Yeah. You guys, oh, it's the beard, you know. Is that what still it is? have years of development. Like, you're very, very I got cool. a little bit of wisdom. He's just like <laughs> yeah, full he's, wisdom. He's got he's plucking fucking wisdom out of that thing left and right. That's so it. So side scan, and it's funny. Like it started off where you throw, we threw like a couple, and then like holy crap, did the bass react to it? And like, and it was like one of those days where I mean, we're trolling, we're throwing top water, and they're just. They're just, they're there. I can see them and nothing is happening. Yeah. But man, you throw three pogies out there, all of a sudden the whole school came up. So now I just do it everywhere. I mean, you know, I did that show where we did it in the bay, but I use it out front. I use it anywhere. Like, mm. damn, I even tried it with the bluefin that we had in Rhode Island this year. And it worked. Yeah. But then they ate all the live chum and they did not touch our base. I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how smart they are sometimes. When they want to be, they could be stupid other times. But it is probably the most exciting way to fish because once you get them going, I mean, you keep throwing them. And it's funny, you lead them. So you'll throw one out far because let's say I see them on the side scan, they're 40 feet over. So, you know, Tom Brady and a couple pogies out there, they come up and you just start throwing them incrementally close to the boat. And it's like, Sometimes it gets so intense, though, with the customers, you know, I'm trying to get them to throw top water and stuff, and they're just looking, and they'll, they'll do the freeze, you know, because they're like, whoa, 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 and I'm, you got a cast, throw it, it's anywhere. <laughs> oh, I love it. Top water, go-to lure. I mean, the dock. Yeah. We've been using the dock for so long. I mean, I literally know who discovered the dock. Hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Joel Swan, he was a teacher in Swansea, Mass, and he came into the saltwater edge, and he was good friends with this other captain, Corey Petrazic. And the idea was, because at the time, a lot of it was the rebel jumping minnow. Mm-hmm. It was a lot how Corey fished, and that thing was catching all kinds of fish. I mean, big fish, 30-pound bass, you know, it would just draw so many strikes. And it was, Joel saw it when, like, the internet was starting to get going. He found it online, and it was nothing more than a massive jumping middle i think at the time too they were like seven dollars hmm. wow uh, nothing is seven dollars anymore no no you can't buy a hook for seven dollars no but it is it is tough to beat the dock i mean that thing will call up fish you know from 35 feet you know they'll come right up any standard modifications you're making to it these days now my biggest thing's just inline singles yeah you know it's captain friendly but like a lot of people when it just seems like the trebles have enough drag that sometimes people have a hard time getting it to walk. Yeah. Whereas with the inline single, it kind of just keeps it like, it's like a keel and it seems like they can walk it a lot easier. Yeah. And actually we, I feel like with the trebles, we lost, we would, you'd hook fish and you'll still hook a lot of fish, but like a lot, some of the bigger fish, those VMC trebles, we were either breaking that welded on barb or they would roll and get it out. Whereas like, you know, those 40, 50 pound bass, with that inline single, it's all the way around the jaw. Like, there's nothing yeah, they can do. Way more bite. Yeah. And the trebles, too. It seems like sometimes those bass, when we hook them, they sound because Newport's all rock. They shake it out. You know, they can find something else for that treble to get hooked on and then just shake it. And you come up with all this seaweed in the small rock. And you're like, oh, man, what happened? Yeah. Hmm. What's, like, your your average size bass when you're live chumming these fish? I mean, is everything more or less over 30 inches? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Most of them are that 25 to 30 pound range. Yeah, so that's one thing that's kind of, I would say, tricky by us, you know, like to bring pogies, say, in the North River, I don't think would make sense. No, but Tinker Max, live Tinker chumming. Max, you could do, but they, they kind of yeah, get eaten underwater size. a little yeah. more, though, maybe. Yeah. But... Yeah, I'm just trying to think of like ways you could utilize some of these ideas 
by us. I mean, you could try out it, you front. Know? You know, when they're in the pogies, you wonder if you can kind of grab some of the bass off the schools of pogies and get your own little thing going. You, you probably know. could because yeah. you're stunning them. Like, I right. like to chuck them as high as I can and then do the old. Right. Yeah. Um, but even in the North River, if the bass aren't exactly big enough, you could still get them to chase them and just bait and switch. True. Because it's funny, when we're live chumming, most of the fish we're catching are with the dock. Yeah. Right? We're not even putting the pogies on. Basically peeling them up off You're just the getting them up. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because you think of how many times they're like chasing a pogey and they're not going to eat it if they're right. twenty eight inches. Yeah, you know, uh, yep. they do the old round and around and around and around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if you throw a little something smaller in there, yeah, they got that'd them. be sick. They're already horned up, you know. Yeah, it's a good idea. Now that we're on the tactic brainstorm, if you had a week or more to focus on a new tactic, it doesn't have to be like a new to the fishing world, but like new to your fishery, something you haven't tried, what would you want to try? Like if you had a returning client call me, he's like, I want to do whatever the fuck you want to do. You want to try something new, cool. What would you want to? Oh man, I want to learn and make a reality of using downriggers and trolling live baits for bluefin in Rhode Island. You know, because, like, we have this cool new emerging bluefin fishery that we got, and it's, like, it's kind of like I look at it like a Cape Cod Bay, but, like, a little bit bigger, you know, like the way the contour is. And I literally just want to, like, put down four-pound bluefish on these, like, five-pound balls and just troll them all, all over and just keep trolling yeah. them down. I think that would work well. So I was, tell- I was telling you a few weeks ago, like, I feel like there's a troll bite that's going to emerge in this bay thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, like, you know, Damon is very good at trolling right. mackerel. And, you know, he's got his little weight system and stuff like that that he does. But, you know, I've always just wondered, like, if I could sp- look a heavy downrigger ball, something I know I can control the depth specifically and accurately. Or just a planer with, like, a mullet on it. Or, yep. you know, I planer with a dead bluefish. You could rig up those smaller bluefish to swim. I've Did been you- saying this for a little while, but even squid bars, dude. Po- pogey's dead right take the backbone out so it's literally just like a butterfly bait yeah you, know, you have them cut perfectly down the tail no backbone and their head's so big that you could load them lead heavy in the head and they should fucking just like rag flutter i mean out. even live trolling po- like what we how we fish in the bay for stripers right is when i'm trolling pogies it's just on braid bridled and no weight yeah i've wanted to try that too for bluefin it's like you know sometimes i'm like i finish my drift and i'm like man you know i could drop these things back like 130 feet i could bridle them i mean even though i know it's heavy mono and just troll them they'll swim yeah because a lot of times when they're eating them i mean i fish so much just high floaters anyway as it is it's like why not just pull them around yeah what do we do for bass well the guys carolinas they're doing that Mike and Connor got a couple in the bay doing that with mackerel. Yeah. You know, off the riggers, trolling valve. Yeah. Yeah. You know, on the surface, 90 inches or so. Yeah. I know the guys in the Carolinas in towards the beach are using pogies and bluefish, bump, either bump trolling or trolling valve or whatever. I think they're super slow off the riggers. Yeah. I think the downrigger thing would annihilate. Even on the bank with that. Yeah. You yeah, know? it keeps you, you just, you could literally, I mean, I guess as long as there wasn't a lot of boats anchored, but imagine if you could troll the whole yeah. contour of the bank from north to south. Right. Yeah. There's no way. There's just so make. many fish up high in the bank, though. I know. That no one fishes. Like, everyone's anchored on, on the edge, and we get it because the bait's there a lot of the times. And the, you know. No, all the fish are on the there's edge. There's so, nothing. Yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> there's <laughs> so nothing many, up high at all. There's so many fish up high. I don't know how many times you're getting bait and you're marking them and you're like, let's drive away from these and anchor on the edge. Like, it makes no know. fucking sense. It doesn't. I mean, even on the other edge, man, I remember I know. one year I was up here and it was like, I had Scotty. Scotty was fishing with me, Scott Sinclair a bunch. And like, our whole goal was just, let's just go out and do nothing but troll Ballyhoo on the, uh, on the eastern edge. And it worked. It's awesome. We put some time into it. That's awesome. Yeah, we got to troll for big fish more. I mean, we always do up till about 4th of July and have good results, but I think it would work. big bars in the bay, dude. No one is trolling 
Big squid bars in the bay. And remember, there was a time when that was the way to fish was big bars. It was yeah. like live bait. It's like, what do you mean we're going to put these bars out? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just have like in my basement huge piles of just giant mole craft squids. Oh, yeah. I mean, the first bluefin I ever saw was on bite was on a bar. We didn't get it, but it jumped into <laughs> the middle. You don't. <laughs> it jumped into the middle of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, they those. wreak havoc on bars, especially when they're like a hundred inches or more. Oh, yeah. It's just fucking absurd what they can do to that tackle. Yeah. I just all those things dragging, all that pressure everywhere oh, yeah. makes a lot of weird noises. Oh my god! So tell us about uh, the bluefin bite down there. Like what? What's like your common procedure as far as like you know what? Are the, what do you think the fish are actually doing there? They're definitely eating. There's a lot of pogies offshore that we have now. I mean, look, this is a new thing. Like, this is yeah. just second year, right? The first year that we kind of found out about them, you know, I remember when I told Matt, it was just because my buddies who lobster were telling me, hey, we're hauling traps. Like, dude, I saw a tuna. Like, it came up right next to the boat and followed the trap up. And I'm like, what? I'm like, all right, whatever. And then three days later, you know, Bo was lobstering, so he mates with me when we're tuna fishing, but he was the lobster, and he's like, Rob, I saw him crashing. Yeah. And I was like, fine, that's it. So then it was like, I went out that next day after after chartering, so I did my two doubles, grabbed my buddy Tristan, and grabbed some bluefish, and we went out there, and I was like, dude, we're, we're going to sit out here till sunset, I don't know what's going to happen. And we went through like four threshers and a dusky shark, and then we got the bite. And it kind of, and it, and it, I mean, it was close. Like, we were close. Yeah. And then I, I just started looking at the contour, and it's like, it it looks like Cape Cod Bay. If you take, like, Point Judith, Sakana, and everything, and how, you know how Cape Cod Bay is, and they just do that loop. Yeah. And, like, so that year, we caught a couple in July. They closed the quota. You know, we went on bass fishing, and I still came up to Plymouth for that September because it was so new. It's like I couldn't bank on it, you know, with clients that, yeah. you know, are coming. I'm like, you know, I know I know the, the bank of Bay Bite. I know I can do that. And we came up here, and it was good. But then this season that we just had, it was like I started seeing them. Like I would do this thing where we'd go bass fishing, and then I was going out to some of my outer sea bass humps to kind of like keep checking, keep checking. And so now we're like, <laughs> oh, we're just going a little further. <laughs> I can already see it now. <laughs> when we're out there sea bass fishing, all of a sudden, like I started seeing them, you know, they're in the gear, they're in the pots. And, you know, there was a, a lot of bait out there. We actually had a lot of mackerel kind of like inshore mackerel that I hadn't seen. So I think it kept them around. And there was just so many, so many more fish that it was like, all right, I'm going to give it a go this September. I'm not going to go up north. We're going to keep it local, and we're going to yeah. stay here. No, we missed you in the bay this year. I know. Yep, and no big green boat. Yeah. What kind of hull is that thing? Terry Jason. Terry Jason. Yeah. She's wide. It's a sweet boat. It's my favorite. Thing is awesome. How long have you had that boat? So it'll be six years now. Yep. What have you done for, I mean, I'm sure you've done a lot. What kind of major work have you done with it? I mean, well, replacing the fuel tanks. Uh, wow, that's gut, never gutted, good. Gutted all the rails; they were all rotten. Um, right now, we're putting a new engine in. What are you oh, putting yeah. in? Uh, QSL nine, Sweet. 450. Yep, that'll be nice. Oh yeah, and I know because there's a guy Peter Graham that had a Terry Jason, and he put that motor in. So I'm going exactly with what he did because his numbers were sick. I mean, he's got at cruise twenty knots, twelve gallons an hour. Wow. That's freaking awesome. Yeah. I wish we could go 20 knots. We're 14, 8 in the big boat. Yeah. We're 28 in the big boat. It's not bad boat. going to the bank because you kind of have enough time to prep and like figure out your day. But yeah. you're going, you know, to the east side. Peak at Hill. Peak at Hill. When the oh, yeah. bite's there, it's like you got that. There has to be a herd there for us to want to go there. Right. Because yeah. it takes that time. That's how it used so to be with far. me with the 6 ETA. It was, you know, we were 15 knots. If I was pushing it, so like when we would go, like if we were fishing anywhere out east past Peacot Hill, it was like, man, I'd always be like, I would second guess it to the nines because I'm yeah. like, you know what? I mean, I feel like I could just sit right here and they're uh-huh. going to come by. Yeah. Why are we going all the way over there? Yeah. yeah. You know, but then I got like Colin or Dom or someone being like, it's sick of me. And they're so jazzed up anyway. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> you're twitching. Oh, man. Oh. It is bad when like, you talk to them on the 
you know, foam midday and they tell you about their morning. Yeah. And you feel like you just totally fucked up. Nope. That's why sometimes I just don't answer. I'm just like, I'm just going to stick to my plan. Yeah. Live or die. By Usually it. it pays off though to stick to a plan. Yes. It does. It does. It does. Uh, added a trolling motor. That was big when we put that on the boat. Really? Big. What size? Uh, so we had the 87 inch trolling yep. motor. Minn Kota. Minn Kota. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On the big boat. On the big boat. Interesting. Yeah. What was like, what's your max sea condition with that thing on the big boat, you think? Mm, probably 18 knots or so, wind. You know, if it gets more than that, depending on the sea state, you can still hold. Because what I'll do is I'll put the trolling valve in gear and fight the trolling motor to offset the wind so that it almost cancels everything out so that the trolling motor will just push against the boat and keep it there. Just spins around. They basically work against each other and hold you. It's smart. Mm-hmm. Should try that. Are you using that a lot, tuna fishing? Oh, it's the best. Yeah. It's Brian used it a lot this year, too. Thing is unbelievable. Yeah, because, like, you know the days where, like, you're like, yeah, I want to drift to cover ground, but, like, the drift's all wrong, and, like, your baits are just going like this. <laughs> yeah. yeah again, you put that on, and it's it's great. Or, you know, that, all right, like, I really want to stay in this zone. And when you get a bite, you don't freak out. You're like, all right, we have a bite. Yeah. Turn off the trolling motor, and it comes up, and there's nothing else to worry about. It's so nice. Oh my god, it's unbelievable. Or the mornings you show up, and it's like on slack, and you don't want to have to, you don't want to fish the swing, and you yeah. can yeah, just you can stay set up where you right want. there, wait, yeah. wait for the swing to go through, it, and no then, matter what the tide is, you're in the spot. Exactly. Yeah. I think you'll see pretty much every boat up here in the next ten years with a trolling motor. Yeah, I agree. You know, there they seems seems to be. I don't forget who I was talking to, but someone said. Someone I was talking to was saying that we're always like 10 years behind Florida. Like you look down to Florida, like Everyone there's not a boat one. that doesn't have a trolling motor, right. even yeah. like these 40 foot oh, but remember, cat boats and shit. We're also Yankee ingenuity. You know what I mean? Right. Like you don't see the money that you do see in Florida. Right. Like we will still go fish on our little whaler and you know, yeah. it's budget conscious and yeah. trolling motor is a big purchase. It is. So it's like, and a lot of guys, you know, we buck the norm up here too. It's like, why do I need that? I've been anchoring for forever works great yeah Doesn't all it takes is a few news. guys you know like oh, you yeah. that outproduce other people and yeah i mean that's making a difference you know? it, I, I, and i will say i think it calls fish in because uh in 2021 in the bay there was several times where you know it was a bigger fleet and we got the bite that day where a lot of people didn't mm-hmm. everyone's fishing pogies I mean, the leader's all the same. We're all in the same area. The only thing that I had going on that was different is I was sitting on a trolling motor, you know? Yeah. Just because, and I would just go, like, I would get, I got a bite. So then it happened three days in a row. I went back to the same exact spot that I got a bite. And there's no, like, spots in the bay. The bay's mud. Yeah. Go to that same spot, got another bite. Another bite. Yeah. Three days in a row. And I'm like, dude, it's got to be. And I've noticed it now, too, where I'll put the trolling motor out. And I had it happen this year with us where I didn't even have baits ready. And all of a sudden, there's a fish underneath the boat 15 feet milling around. I'm like, what the heck? And the only thing is that trolling motor is going yeah. to make I think it. they think it's a whale. Yeah, something. That's what I think. Well, I he, ha- he had a whale basically bang his trolling motor. Yeah, for an hour and a half. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 like did. belly rolling under the boat. I have it all in video. I should post it at some point. You know, mark it up on the sounder like 10 feet underneath the hull little minky whale and there was nothing it was like two sheer waters it was kind of like a hail mary afternoon tide yeah. change give her a go to, before we go home on the west edge and there's a minky like a mile down the line from us it comes right up and then stayed on us for an hour and a half so, you, with the motor. so if he can hear that from that far away you know yeah. that thing's transmitting yeah. sound 100 percent has to be has to be i think they're badass oh yeah kind of goes into the same principle we were talking about is like turning your motor on at the end of the day and leaving your rods out for a little bit, right? Yeah. How many bites you get doing that or leaving your motor on for a little bit when you first set up, putting a few baits in, like, you know, first thing in the morning, if you're one of the first people on the bank or any spot and you get a bait in quick, like you instantly have that advantage. Yeah. They're coming you to know? look at you. Oh, yeah. If you're fishing around a bite where there's draggers, you start taking some chains over the side and clanking yeah. them together. Yeah. You know? Run the hauler. So you do whatever. you attach a few chains to your beard and run around the cockpit. <laughs> <laughs> Stretch it out. <laughs> What's the weirdest thing that you've done to try to get a bite? Oh, man. I had this one time where it was, uh, 
I was talking to my buddy Jay Senciello and like Tyler on the Cynthia C. He was out there and I was just goofing around. It was just a little bit slow. And I was like, I took the nastiest bait I had to get a bite. And I was like, look, this is what's going to work. And I had this dried blue fish and I wrote bite me on it. And I shoved like 20 ounces in its mouth and just put a hook in its back. And that's what got bit. <laughs> goes to show you yeah oh yeah it's unbelievable. i mean that's but that's how my stick baits go they're the ugliest things ever you know like yeah. i i did find out though if you take a live pogey if it's alive you can t- shove an 18 ounce bank sinker right in its mouth and it won't tear hmm. interesting yeah and i hog ring it so it has all these nice hog rings how long are they alive for uh no it dies right after that operation <laughs> that is that is what brings it to so, its end so theoretically you could do it yeah yeah okay that is what I, brings it to its end. yeah I, ha- I i have a video of it actually i thought you're gonna be like oh it stays alive for like two to four hours no no, 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 great. no, no. i yeah it is i choke a pogey to death with a hook in its back right <laughs> okay but it is uh and it you hog ring it, and then I just put the hook, this giant 12 volt, right in its back. But I did all that, and I put seaweed on my weights. But I do that just to mess with people, mostly my customers. I'm like, we got to put sea, I, I'm because it it will get them to get seaweed out of the water. So I'm like, look, it, we need to find some seaweed to, to cover our weights up. So you're purely just entertainment. All the time. He just yeah. has his clients raking the ocean <laughs> surface. Yeah, I mean, look at they're cleaning up oh, all that grass. They're casting docks, freaking fifty yards away, getting in little piles of. Seaweed. We were doing that though, pogey snaggers during bad weeds. Remember? Yeah. Casting them, dragging the weeds away from the floaters. Casting pogey snaggers of blue sharks coming up on the balloons. Away. Oh yeah. May or may not be kosher. Ah, I mean, we weren't it, it, hooking a lot of yeah, them with the snow. We did not hook them. We no. just smashed them in the back with the pogey snagger. Right. Oh, I have so many. I wanted to find this funny video for you because you have to see this to believe me about how much weight you can stick into a pogey. Yeah, we were fishing what six and eight ounce sinkers. Six and eights, so yeah. On our stick baits. Oh, here it is. Pogies. There, see. Yeah, put it up to the camera if you want. He takes it. <laughs> really takes it. <laughs> Pogi didn't mind a thing, though. Eh? All right. That's amazing. That's fucking awesome. Hmm. I could try doing more lead. Yep. But they have to be alive because when they're dead, it just. Yeah. Hmm. How often were you running stick bait pogies? All the time. You always have one, no matter what. Or bluefish. I do like stick. I mean, we make even those big old blues. If one dies, stick bait. Yeah. What are you using for a skewer in one of those fucking pigs? You can buy on Amazon these giant like barbecue skewers. Yeah. Yeah. Wicked long. Would we use? I want to say it was just wooden dowel from yeah something. Yeah. I think it was like that would work. Lowe's wooden dowel, yeah, quarter inch old arrow shaft. You can use that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that would hurt. <laughs> yeah, it would. Yeah. It worked though. Yeah. You know, put a field point on there, slide it right, right on up. It's not going to break, but mm. so what was the bite like down there? Like as far as fleet size and quantity of fish and all what that your kind typical of stuff? spread was, it- that sort of thing. It varied as far as the bite was very good. Fleet size always varied, you know, because it we had actually the one thing that was nice is this year is that the bite was happening in, in a few different locations, you know, so like on different sides of block, there was bite going on. And then like, you know, the inside bite was happening, you know, vice versa. So um, like in September, the bite really started for us by coxes, and it was it was crazy. It was like a morning bite, and it, they would come through in a wave, and it was just like you'd be sitting out there, the sun would come up, and then it was just like this line of shearwaters a mile long just going like this. But it, the, the weird thing about that, it was bluefin and yellowfin. So really? like the, the opening day in September, hmm. you know, I had Seth on the boat, and we doubled up, and we ended up getting an 85-incher and a 100-pound yellowfin. That's, That's sick. really cool. And it was that like, cool. whoa. This is wild. That's awesome. But then once that fizzled out, you know, we just fished on the inside. You know, and the Rhode Island fleet is, 
it's not that I wouldn't say it's that big. You know what I mean? I mean, it, it could get crowded. I mean, there was one day when it was crowded and the fish absolutely committed suicide. I think there was like 30 something fish landed on that small corner. Like 50 boats, 100 boats? No, I'd say probably like 40 boats. 40 boats. You know. That's a manageable fleet right there. Yeah. yeah it's spread not, out a little bit. It's not like Especially up, if it's not like a shark edge. It can be like, you know, I remember some years when like the bank was really good. And it's like, you know, you left like the day before just to camp out. And yeah. then even when you went to sleep and woke up the next day, you were like, how am I going to land a fish in this? Yeah. Is my anchor line wrapped in with that guy? And it was <laughs> it crazy. Bad. You're like... Can I even walk a fish out of this? The tournaments, you know, I you know, love tournaments, fish a lot of tournaments. When the, the tournaments in July, August, September yeah. on the bank, it's, it's like unfishable. I mean, even the bay over the past couple of years up here, like in 2021, I noticed like dude, the fleet size had probably tripled, yeah. if not more, you know, because I remember fishing it. Mm-hmm. Back in the day, even when we had my 28 BHM, where it was like, if it was crowded that day, you know, it was you were looking at like 11 guys. Yeah. And you were like, man, did they, how did they find out? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now like a, a, a light day's 50 boats. December, there was like 40 boats. I know. You know? Yeah. A few, few days, there was probably close to 300 boats in the bay. Yeah. Yeah. It was every, like the bank was, there was no one there. Yep. Um, there's still fish in the bank. It's just, you know, it's close to home for a lot of harbors. So when they right. go and they can catch bait either the day before or. Yeah. That's the thing the, the bait situation has been so much better. I mean, I remember when we first used to fish the bay, the first part of the day was run to the bank yeah. and go get the biggest mackerel you could to run back into the bay. Yeah. yeah. Or it was to get whiting, you know, like oh, yeah. the dragger thing. Like we never fished a floater when we were younger. Mm-hmm. Like, it was like two baits at a 90 and 120 feet or yeah. two at 120. It was like never anything above 80 feet. But that's feet, when the really. draggers were there. When the draggers yep. were there. Now it's like everything, not everything's high because we seem to be about 50-50. I know because yeah. you don't see the whiting draggers really anymore. Yeah. Hardly. But they're there. I mean, not. La- I don't think we caught one on a whiting last year, but the year prior we caught quite a, a few on yeah. whiting. Yeah, it's not like they stopped eating them. Yeah, no, exactly. No. And I know Jeffries was a ton of whiting bites yeah. this year. I just think their focus changes so drastically when the pogies are that thick. Yeah. And it's such a nice bait. You it know? is. You get that in your head and it's like, I need the pogies. I know. The bite is sick. It is sick. The surface pogie eat is, <sighs> it's unbelievable. <sighs> or the kite pogie eat. Yeah. You think of how many fish are in those inshore pogie schools that no one ever sees. How oh. many tunas? Yeah. I mean, it's got, like, think of how many, like, bass fleets, even with 100 boats, you know there's a few giants oh. flying through during the course of the day that Definitely. no one sees. Probably swimming around in Plymouth Harbor at nighttime eating small kids and dogs, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> they're, like, they're like Florida, they're like golf course alligators. <laughs> they are. You can hear in the news one day. Small dog attacked by a 97-incher. I mean, for us, I mean, even Rhode Island, I mean, I, one of the fish we caught this year, it was five minutes from my dock. I mean, it was inside of the bay. Granted, the way Rhode Island's bay is very deep, but it was like, you know, that was odd. Yeah. They were just harassing some bluefish. You must have been stoked on that, though. Dude. To catch one, like, five minutes from your freaking dock. That's sick. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, in, inside of all land. like Yeah. In, and that's yeah. when I'm, like, convinced. I'm like, yeah, they they must come in Did here. you have bluefish with you when that oh, happened? Yeah, or did you, yeah, because okay. I, I have them loaded in the pen at all yeah. times. So, yeah. You know, and normally the, the day goes is, you know, keep the bluefish pen loaded. And after we catch a fish, you know, on the way back, we'll spend some more time catching some bluefish. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Do you have? Oh God! No, you go ahead. I was gonna say, do you have any tricks with? Uh, we're always asked technical questions because people love it. They listen to this. The uh, we, you know, everyone kind of has issues with pogies redding out. Do you have any like? Um, and you may not want to divulge any tricks. Do you have any tricks that you might want to share with people, like how to keep your pogies from redding out, or do you not care if they red out? I don't care so much if they red out. I mean. I would probably just take a magic marker and, and color them or add some glitter to them yeah. when they're alive. You know, I will, I might even spray paint them while they're alive. Yeah. Just to get rid of some of the red, but, uh, my bait pen. I think he's being serious. I Are too. you being serious? Oh yeah. I, okay. I would do something like that, but I've caught so many fish on red pogies. Yeah. Cause the one thing is right. 
let's let's just think about this. A red pogey doesn't look good to us, right? But we're not the ones eating it. How many times have you seen them eating stinky dragger baits or stinky lobster baits or? Know. You know, like you're just chumming with like shriveled up mackerel and they'll come eat that chum. So yeah. I don't think they care too much, but it is nice to have fresh baits because I think, yeah, they give off a better vibe. So to keep them not from getting red, if you're going to keep them in a bait pen is have a long bait pen. So we kind of switched up. Actually, I've learned Seth gave me some chem tanks, which I'd never had chem tanks. Yeah, before. we're doing that this year. Yeah. Wow. They keep baits nice, but there's a, a capacity amount that, that they, you know, can hold. But they mm-hmm. definitely swim around and they're nice and free. Now, when you have like a wire cage and you want to have pogies, the one that I found worked the best is I have one that's seven feet long and it's like five feet deep. I think I've like seen it. Four, yeah. It's, oval, like big oval. Yeah, it's massive. And I feel like it does two things. One, it's deep enough so that because gulls will always land on top of your bait pen. If they're on top of it and the pogies don't have enough depth to feel comfortable, then they are always freaking out and they're getting red banging into it. So it yeah. seemed like they would always stay low and they needed to have a nice run to go this way and then turn around and come back. Otherwise, it just like a the whole circle. Mm-hmm. It makes but, sense. But the chem tank definitely too was a was a game changer because it seems to get like this little bit of a slime on it mm-hmm. and then once that slime inside of the tank is there they they really don't rub on it you yeah. know they, no. they it's almost swim. like they rejuvenate yeah you've noticed that that there's nothing which, abrasive on the side which yeah. can happen and it, it's you know having multiple bait pens because sometimes you know you get bait greedy it's like oh man i really smushed the bait and it's it's hard not to take all this live bait that you know you're going to be fishing for the next couple days and jam it into this pen have a couple pens so that you can you know put a few in here put a few in there Mm -hmm. and then like you said they will rejuvenate you i mean i've had pogies that have lived over a week you know in plymouth harbor when we were fishing there because they have good water flow yeah and like they would just swim around stay happy Hmm. Yeah, I think the chemtainer is a big tip, which again, Florida. Yeah. Go back to that point. No one, they've had them for 10 plus years easily. And and your live well on your boat is another important thing. So like the way my live well set up is it constantly almost leaks out the lid. So it's pressurized because even if it's a calm day, just the motion of the boat. And if you have a good volume of water, I mean, it's going to start sloshing like this. Yeah. Those baits are getting smashed into the side. So you yeah. really got to have a live well that's pressurized. Yeah. I mean, even if it's like a portable one that you take, you almost want to find a way to put some kind of lid on it to keep that sloshing to an absolute minimum. Mm-hmm. You know, because that'll, that'll ki- kill your baits or make them really red. I do kind of a Yankee ingenuity method with the center console while I just take like a scrap piece of an ice bag and I'll put it over the overflow for the well and then take a number 64 band and basically just seal off the overflow. And then I'll just, just like... Just comes out the top. Yeah, and just get it to start bubbling yeah. out the lid. Exactly. You know? Yeah, because then they're not banging around. They're, yep. they're happy. Yep. And it also, like, if you're going to ice down, like if you're going to keep herring alive, it doesn't let any of that cold water, you know, as you're moving, slosh around, start to dip out of the tank. You can like almost pressurize it with the ice water in there. And then make a move, and then your temperature is never changing. I always shut my pickup off if I'm going to move. Mm-hmm, so I'm yeah. not putting new water in there. And I've played around with air stones and oxygen and adding that in. And, it, you know, it made some difference. Depends. Like herring, definitely. Yeah. Adding yeah. the air stone. But, like, pogies and mackerel, they're a little hardier. Definitely. And then bluefish are just super hardy. Yeah. This year, I think we're going to do some version of, like, a tuna tube bucket for mackerel see that's i was thinking the same thing this year for bluefish because you know sometimes we're drifting a lot during a contour hey, be able to just pop we're, them off or, or we're, keep them on we're hopscotching into the whales because like up on the bank and coxes and stuff when the whales are feeding you know it seems like the fish aren't really that far behind them so you want to like almost set yourself up and let the whales kind of come through you naturally yeah and like being able to put bluefish keeping the hook in and put them in the tube because you know you got three baits and you got one live well, and it's like you, you can't put you could put one back and unhooking them and rehooking them sometimes is yeah kind of a pain. Where I think like the bucket with with the tubes would be sick. Yeah, you would fire sick. them out. Yeah, you could probably make one of like a fifty five gallon drum for bluefish. Yeah. Oh yeah, you know with some big PVC and just yeah. Like, I was looking at how some of those were made. It's 
granted, it's probably worth just buying one when it comes to the smaller ones. But if you're making a bluefish one, you could, it's pretty easy to make it, I think. Yeah, oh, a few yeah. hundred bucks and you could get all the materials. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would probably get like one of the hooker electric pumps that would get it all set up yeah. fancy yeah. fancy just because. But yeah, like you said, even being able to fire it out yeah. quickly. I mean, because that happens a lot. Now the way I tune a fish with side scan has changed. Like even the last like three years fish in the bay and fish in rhode island a lot of it i would drive around first and either try to mark fish or carpeted bait on the bottom yeah and in rhode island there was a couple times where i'm kind of going along the contour i'd start you know and i'd be like all right i'm just gonna cruise do this four mile loop just see if i see him first before i set up and like i'd get like two and a half miles in and i would just see like three on the side and I'd be like <laughs> yeah are you tweaking like the factory settings, I guess, with your side scan. Big time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm running 455 on the Hummingbird uh, Solex because it gives you the most range and it, 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 you can see, you know, big images, no problem, right? Because, like, it has, if you look at like a Solex unit, it has 455, 800 megahertz, and then it has mega. In reality, mega imaging. It gives you super detailed imaging, but those are guys that are on a bass circuit or those yeah, guys that are one looking large for mouth. crappie. You know what yeah, I mean? Like, yeah. I'm not looking for that. I don't need, I want to have maximum distance. And it's like the bluefin show up as these like streaks. Yeah. And you can see them clear as day. And like big pogey schools carpeted on the bottom, they show up no problem. Yeah. And, and the good thing is the 455 works in pretty good depth. So even in 180 feet, you know, I can mark fish and see them. I mean, when we had our yellowfin bite, you know, it, our fleet was really big on that because a lot of people were concentrating, like hyper-focused on the whales. So like you couldn't even really fish because it was, you know, you got a bunch of guys jigging, a bunch of guys trolling. So I would just go away and stay on the outskirts and I would find a smaller pod of tuna on the side scan, but it was awesome. Cause I'd see him and I'd be like, all right, port side, you turn, put that spread over. Bang. Sick. That's awesome. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Dion Children Foundation. The Dion Children Foundation was established by the Dion family as a way to bring awareness to rare and ultra rare genetic diseases in children, such as limb girdle muscular dystrophy or LGMD. LGMD is a neuromuscular disease that causes progressive muscle weakness, leading to the loss of ambulation and eventually affects the heart and lungs. Recently, the Dion family was faced with the heartbreaking news that their son Peter and daughter Maggie were diagnosed with LGMD and are battling this rare disease. The core belief at the Dion Children Foundation is that no child should be left behind. For more information or to donate to this incredible cause and family, please visit the DionFund.org. The Dion Foundation is also the official charity of the 2023 Nantucket Big Game Battle. So if you are fishing that event this summer, uh, good luck and thank you so much for the support. Technology's come a long way. It is. I mean, so we've been playing now with uh, live imaging sonar and I've been using it ice fishing. I cannot wait to just have it. Like I have it all set up. I know how I'm going to mount it because you can use it even when you're trolling. So imagine like having your spread out, putting the, the sonar in the back. So now you can see your lures in the spread mm -hmm. and knowing when a fish is coming into the spread and not, yeah. right? So that now is wild. if a fish is in the spread, but he doesn't react, now I got my naked ballyhoo or something where I'm going to be like, Woo, and yeah. I know exactly, I know where he is, what bar he's behind, you know, without him showing himself. Hmm. It's, it's crazy. Because awesome. I mean, you see footage from people like, towing dredges and stuff like that and like how many fish came up and they were there and then they kind of just went tunas especially tunas come up and look at stuff so All much that time. people never see you know billfish a lot of times they'll show themselves but in bluefin you, you got a faint boil like how many times we had a boil behind a bar that's six inches wide that turns into the size of the cockpit yeah you know, like just by moving a bar. And none of their fins like light up. Like there's right. no indicator. Really at hard all. to see. Yeah. Really hard. Yeah. yeah and that would be sick being able to see them without them knowing you see them and you can tease a bar. I guarantee you could get them to yeah, entice them. Get bite. a lot more bites. And then even when you're drifting like your live baits, like I'll have it out facing all the baits. So now I can see the bluefish and the pogies swimming around on the screen. I mean, dude, 
I know I'm going to be glued to the screen. So like, I know everyone that's on the boat fishing with me is going to be glued to the screen. I mean, I almost want to get HDMI out so I can have a big screen, <laughs> yeah. you know, and just put a couch right in the center and be like, dude, let's go. <laughs> oh, that's great. So you're able to see like what angle are you able to see? Are you able so to you, basically- you can change it. Mm-hmm. So like either landscape or down imaging, stuff like that. I mean, I just got some freshwater stuff that I could show you later is like on, on just fishing it through the ice, but like watching how the fish react is crazy you know and and i think maybe like sometimes too it's like okay if i have it on my down down rod and i see the fish and you got a tuna and he's rising to the bait maybe i can do something to it to get the bite like if he comes up doesn't eat it goes down you you've seen it like just on 2d it's like up down up down well if he doesn't get it on the first try when he starts coming up on the second maybe i'm just gonna go like this and try to take it give him a little takeaway yeah and see if that'll get him a little takeaway Good old yep. takeaway. Look, look, take keep away. away. You can't have that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you have? Do you have any? You seem like you would. We know. I know Taylor and I do. Do you have any just f- off the wall theories that you are just dead set on that you like? Like the fish always feed into the wind, or the fish always feed into the current. Like tuna specific. Is there anything that you're like? Yes, they always hunt with the sun at their back. So I know that. You know, as that sun comes up from the east, they're going to be traveling to the west. And then when it goes the other way, they're going the other way. I agree with that. And that's paid off really for me thought about so it. many times. Yeah. But many times trolling, I've noticed in the beginning of the year, we, you know, a lot of the fish are out east. So we go east. And a lot of times, like, oh, you know what? Let's go work the edge. Like, think of how many times you're working the edge and the sun's at your back yeah. and you're getting bites, Yeah, you know? Yeah, I mean, in Rhode Island, it paid off a couple times this year where, you know, the, in the fleet, guys were getting bites and I was like, all right. And it was kind of congested and I was like, look it, let's just go. You know, we're getting close to sunset. We're going to go four miles back towards the east. When that sun gets low, those fish are going to come back this way. And we sat there and you, you, it's tough because you're listening to a few hookups. But then like I'd hear of a hookup that's getting a little closer to the east. I'm like, they're coming. We're on the right contour. Yeah. Like, Wait. And then hmm. we'd get them in the evening all by ourselves, you know? Yeah. I mean, it makes sense one. looking at the bank in the morning. You mm-hmm. get that outgoing falling tide where all your baits are up on the edge. And how many times you're watching the sun the rise. They're coming from, coming the, from the sun. Up onto, right the, into your shit. Mm-hmm. up onto the bank and yeah. where that's one thing I'm going to be looking at a lot more this year. Yeah. It's a good theory. It is. What other theories do you have? The fish in the bay are the meanest facts. Yeah. They're big. They're big. I think they're just, once they get over that like 105 range. Yeah, they're, they're just, just always so mean. Though. So mean. I think it's because they're so aggressive. To eat a fucking bluefish, you have to be aggressive in itself. Yeah. You know? They're old, dude. They yeah. don't want to get away. Yep. So the only fish that I've ever had to hand line because we've parted them off after darting them. Yeah. I will say last year, <clears throat> last year especially, because we had a lot of 105s, 110s, 105s. There were a lot of mean fish on the bank. Yeah. But they're also the same fish, too. Like how many did we got that were full of pogies that are, yep. you know, sun setting, and then you're catching them in the afternoon or whatever on the bank as they're coming out of the bay. Um, How about night fishing down by you? You know, it's funny because I know Matt puts a lot of time in at night and they definitely see fish and, and get bites. For me, I don't put as much time into it just because of my schedule. Yeah. But I would. Yeah. I would if, if I, I don't see why not, you know, sitting out there with some squid. I mean, like I said, I but I might try it in the harbor because I swear, I, I still think they're coming in there eating small dogs and kids. It's like. Yeah, we they were talking cruise, about that too. Like cruise around. They eat it's, almost, it, it's, well, it's almost like they're, you know, when the boat traffic dies, they're going way in tight. Yeah. You know, and then you're getting that early morning bite as they're coming out, basically getting spooked from all the boats. Mm. That was always the hero bite would be I'd go inside a wood end and like I would fish that, you know, the charter would end about an hour and a half after the sunset is when I would pull the plug. And sometimes I would just always try to get in on that on that contour, like kind of in front of the harbor there, and that paid off so many times. Where it was like, all right, sun's down, we're in like false dawn. I mean, last light, and it's just like, boom, we get the bite. Hmm. Yeah, I'm paying attention to that a lot more this year. It's a good point. The bay's <clears throat> tough because 
like charters like for us to yeah for us to do a wood end hail mary i mean like being in plymouth it's nice for us it's a stone ledge hail mary which is the opposite direction right you know that's, you might as well go that's the a west. good one though it no, is they're there no, in the it, afternoon yeah yep hmm. but what other weird fish theories you got how about like to tog anything weird there mm, not really not really keep it simple yeah, yeah. you know keep it simple they're 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 not that smart they're just mean same thing mm. you know other fish theories i mean look at all lures could be white and they work right yeah 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 what's your favorite color striped bass lure white white Man. is oh, that kind of your go-to first so if you're going to like a new spot you're always almost yeah always throwing something white first yep yeah yep. even fresh water even fresh water something bright you can see it. Undersides of most fish are white. You're yeah. always looking up. What color bottom paint you got? Oh, red. Ooh, Dude, red. red's unique. We have white. Yeah, that's one theory that I yep. I believe in. But I, I fucking blue, black, red, white. I, see, I always thought that like, you know, like a pogey school or something off in the distance is like a brownish, purplish, Ooh. red. So Ooh. I was with the, always in the red camp. I like that. I like that mindset. I think the white's a whale, and then once you get bottom growth, it looks like the belly of a whale. That's true. I always used to say that about Dom CV because he's got black bottom paint, but he trailers all the time, so it's like got white spots coming through. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, you look like a whale. That makes sense, though. Fish in the bay structure, red turns to brown, basically. Yeah, Maybe that's like why it's... you're getting the random bites. With the fucking trolling motor, too. Ooh, you got me thinking. Ryan's going to be out back painting the boat half <laughs> red, half, half red, white. Half white. <laughs> Drift one side red, white the Rapala. bay. And, oh, God. Uh, awesome. I do, do have one thing, too, that sometimes I'll do, especially in the bay, that is uh, if I have some pogies that die in the live well, I actually will take them, smash them up into an onion bag, and then put that back in my live well because it recirculates so much. So it seems to make, like, the slightest amount of a slick. Yeah. Little scale shooting out the overflow. Yeah, and there's just like a, just enough like oil scent. Nothing too crazy because you know sharks. But yeah, yeah. And how many times have you got bit? I mean, in the bay, not much life, and then you just got this little pothole slick that comes by and wham. Mm -hmm. You know. Yep. You and, you almost put. Yeah. yeah. Yep. It's like that fishy watermelon smell. That happens. It's smart most of the time. Yeah. What's your biggest charter client pet peeve? Oh. Mm. Like what's something that you're just like, stop right now. <laughs> Mine is when they bring their own rod. Yeah. You know, I, I, I that's not one because like my tall guys, they oh, that's bring, a little different. They bring yeah. all their, but we've had guys bring their own uh, rods. I, which what is, is be my biggest yeah. pet peeve is definitely sometimes just not listening <laughs> at all <laughs> that's like every charter though no most of the time they'll they'll listen after yeah. a bit but like you know or like i guess it would be weird pee habits i've had some real weird things happen so like <laughs> Dude, this, this, going? this one group oh, right? weird we're sitting pee. there and we're catching some blue fishing butt bass we got some like blitzes going on and it's in august and this guy goes, I got to pee. And I'm like, all right, well, the head's down below. And he's like, no, I can't pee on the boat. And I'm like, all right, so what would you like me to do? And he's like, well, can you go beach it over there? And now, meanwhile, I'm in a down east boat and it's all rocks. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, what well, What should I do? And I was like, uh, I mean, look, at, if you want, you got shorts on, you could you could just jump over the side. Maybe you could just pee in the water like you're swimming. You ever pee when you're swimming? And that was like the solution to it. So I, he... We agree on that. Dude, I turn around, and next thing I know, I look, and I see the shorts hit the deck. Dude, for whatever reason, he strips down ass naked while we're in the middle of fishing, <laughs> catching bluefish, and just jumps in the water to take a wink. <laughs> Holy shit. Wow. I haven't had that one happen yet. No. Yeah. You know, or, oh, God. or dropping rods in. That's true. We, yeah. we have some rods go overboard. You know. We've got a couple. 
I'll, I'll tell people, but but I, if if it's new and like a lot of that's a bachelor party, you get the speech. You know, this whole rod combo costs more than the charter. So if you do lose it, you're gonna have to make the call of shame. You know, you gotta yep. call the saltwater edge, give them your credit card. Yep. And, or we'll never hit land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we always use we always say you pay for the ride home, not the ride in, or not the ride fishing. Yeah. That's funny. But other than that, I don't know, just if you're a grumpy individual, which we don't really have, you know. Or actually no, sometimes my one pet peeve is the guys that want to kill and eat everything. They're like, Same. "What else can we kill? Can what else can we kill? What else can we kill?" And I'm like, "We're going to end up scup fishing in a little bit if you keep this up." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's but, tough. Yep. It's tough when they don't care anything about it. What else can we kill? What else can we kill? And then they have to go to CVS to get 14 styrofoam coolers at yeah. the end of the day. And then they throw 90% of it yeah. in the trash yeah. in a month. It's, you know, if, if, you, if you just keep being like every every striped bass we catch, can we kill this one? Can, can we kill this one? I'm like, look, I told you. Like, I don't make the rules. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, don't, I mean, personally, I don't care if you eat it or not. But right now, that's not how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> What's the... What's the scariest moment you've had on a boat or one of? Well, let's see. There's several. One of the scariest is knowing how rough Cape Cod Bay can get, Mm -hmm. you know, staying too long, knowing that you got 40 knot winds coming and you're on a moon and it's just like, oh man, we just mark one. Let's stay, let's stay, let's stay. And then it's getting really rough. And it's like when it takes you from like down in the bay to get to Plymouth four hours, yeah, you know, when you need, you know, turn on the spotlight because you're trying to watch out for pots, and you see that wave, and it just smashes in the window, and you turn it off because you don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> yeah. like, maybe we should go back to sandwich. No, we gotta. We're going to fucking Plymouth. <laughs> it can get rough. Yep, can get rough. Heavy like northwest, way down inside. I had northwest suck. forty with turbo, and it was one of the scariest nights of my life, going from P town to sandwich. The only other one would be the time that we were in the canyons and I, there was a whale shark. And actually, this is gonna this is a poop story. So perfect hybrid. Uh, so I'm sitting out on the bow and I'm I'm taking a dump, and Bo's sleeping and his brother Richie's sleeping. It's when we had this crazy yellow yellowfin bite in the fishtails. You know, man, yeah, like, oh, yeah. remember there was like a it fleet was out there. The nighttime, whatever, eight years ago, so, something like that. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're sitting out there floating around. And yeah, we'd pretty much stopped catching. And so I'm just letting them sleep before we're going to kind of make our way back. And all of a sudden the boat just kind of goes like this while I'm sitting on the bucket. I look down and there's a freaking whale shark and it's scratching itself on the boat. Holy That's crap. Insane. So I'm like, wow, you know what? And I get this idea. I'm like, I'm going to swim with this thing. And I was like, I don't even need toilet paper. So I just <laughs> now I'm the one jumping in naked. So I just jump in naked. You know, after what time, taking my what time of day is this? It's like right in the morning. It's got to be like All 6, right. 30, 7 o'clock. Okay. I was going to say at night. I'm like, no. <laughs> no, no. It's, it's bright. So okay. now I'm sitting there and I'm swimming around with this thing. And I'm like, oh, and he's wicked docile, right? And he's not, he's just chilling. He doesn't even care that I'm in the water. So I grab onto this thing's fin and like, I just feel him shake real quick. And next thing I know, my ears are like, wee. So then I'm like, oh, what the hell? I let go. And now I look up and I see the hull of my boat. And it's like this big. Because, I mean, I'm sure that thing kicks twice. It probably goes a body length or two. Has to. So I'm sitting here under the water looking at my boat really far away. Being like, this is how I'm going to die naked. <laughs> holding on to a whale shark. Try to take a dump. Yeah. And I dump made it. whale shark. That's a fucking awesome I don't awesome think anyone's story. probably ever done that. I think very few people have ridden a whale shark. Not only that, dumping while or trying to dump while yeah. riding a whale shark. Yeah, wiping your butt in the water while riding a whale shark. Yeah, that yeah. was one of Whale the, dump. Yeah. So that would be like one of those things you, you live from and, you know, that was kind of dumb. But, I mean, that's how you, you get stronger. I mean, you we've, all, we've all done it. Yes. That's amazing. I mean, I remember when I got the offshore bug, I'm going to blame Sam from Sam Tolan from Sam's Bait and Tackle. He did. He spoiled me on like my first canyon strip, and then I just wanted to go back every single day. Yeah. To the point where I took my 19 foot center console out to Block Canyon. Yuck. Yep. And it was a floating bomb. So, like, I had all <laughs> these gas cans strapped to the front. I have 250 foot coolers because that was my ice supply, and I had three rods because that's all I, I had. Oh, my God. Now, but see, at the time, I smoked, too. So now here's the dilemma. I get out there, and yeah. I'm on a floating bomb, and I want to smoke, and I want to smoke bad. 
So I'm like, well, what what do we do? And I'm like, and I'm also by myself because I couldn't convince anyone to come with me. Obvious reasons. So Hold I finally. On. So you're going to the you're going to Block Canyon on a 19 foot boat full, full of fuel Jerry while smoking by yourself. So I didn't smoke, okay. but I wanted to. Smoke. You wanted to smoke. So now I get out there and I'm about to put out my my three rod spread of X wraps and I'm like, you know what? Let's just do this. So I get the idea. I take my anchor road and I tie it to my waist, put on a life jacket and push myself off the boat. And that's where I had my cigarette. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Holy shit. Trolled around, caught four yellowfin, which is two in each 150 quart cooler, which the whole trip out there lasted about two and a half hours. And then I turned around and went home because I had no more ice, no more room. That's a tread. Do you have a picture story. of that or video of that? I, I I don't have a picture of it. I have a picture of the be boat. A great picture. I'm pretty sure Tread Barda used to do that on his Mako too. Like he was. Should I think I he was I at like 19 feet is extreme. 800 RPMs at the dock, and then like untying. Yeah, he was so full of fuel. I could see like a 23 I do. I'll have to or dig 26. It I, that is unfucking believable. You said 19. Well, well, the 19 footer held 90. It was a Nosset Islander. Was a boat, so it was actually like a skiff style boat. Mm-hmm. But it was based off like a Seacraft hull, and it held 90 gallons of gas. Wow. Nice. So with that 115 saltwater series, you know, that thing, it, it, it had range. It's a seaworthy 19-footer. Yeah. I mean, the, the worst part about it is when you get back to land after doing that whole loop, you know, for the next four days, all you hear is <laughs> from the two-stroke. <laughs> I'm, I'm on the, uh, I'm like the OG mindset with one mile per foot of boat. That's yeah. a good. Well, yeah, yeah. And that's if you go eighty miles. I realistically want to be in an eighty footer. Yeah, that's and it's true. Like now, you know, I mean, that's when I was, you know, nineteen years old. Yeah, got a little smarter since then. That's what amazing. was your first canyon trip like? Did you get the first canyon trip luck that a lot of people seem to get? Catch everything. It was savage. So, I went out with Sam Tolan from Sam's Bay and Tackle, and he is an incredible offshore fisherman. A lot of what I know about fishing the canyons is from him. So we leave, and it is rough, and we're going to Welker. And we're in this Nauset, uh, no, not uh, Bluefin Canyon Runner. So it was like a walk-around style boat, but mm-hmm. he had this thing set up. We had coolers stacked on the side. You know, we were going on a meat trip. So we pound out there, and we get out there, and it's still a little sporty, and we're, we got the spread out. We're trolling around. I think we picked up one small yellowfin, and it's almost like 10 o'clock. And I look at him, and I was like, how late in the day to big eye bite? All eight rods go down. <laughs> and it's just me and him. <laughs> so we're fighting. I'm fighting big eye, and he's you know maneuvering the boat. And it's like, I get we get six out of the eight. And they were- That's impressive. They That's were, awesome. They were solid fish. They were all like 150 to 180. And I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. So now we're trolling, we're picking off some yellowfin, and then it's like, gets slowed down a little bit. So he just starts, he puts baits down around 500 feet in the middle of the day and catch a giant freaking longfin albacore. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. So now we're back on the troll, and now it's like nighttime, and it is pitch black dark, and he's like, all right, we're just going to troll to the sword spot. So I'm like... I open my mouth again and I go, man, how late at night to big eye bite? All freaking eight rods go down again. <laughs> that time, I think we only got four out of the eight. And I am like, I got blisters on my hands. Like, I am dying. And, in, in, you know, I'm in good shape, but I'm chugging Starbucks, like double shots and monster <laughs> energy drinks just to keep my focus. So then it's like, okay. We get those fish in, and it's like three something in the morning. I mean, it was an ordeal. So now he's putting the sword sword baits out, and we're getting set up for that. And I'll never forget this too. He's like, "I'm gonna go and sleep. You keep chumming." And like I hear him, and he's like slightly snoring. And like I was like, oh, "I'm just gonna start throwing more chum, dude." And I start throwing more chum, and out of a dead sleep, he goes, "You're going too fast." I'm like, "Well." <laughs> <laughs> so then I I go at, at the pace. And then I look and I'm like, I, I, I'm like, I think we're on. And because the balloon is just like moving and I see the light. It came back up. Yeah. 150 pound sword. So then now I've been up Which all is night. solid for a yeah. night. Oh, yeah. I fought that thing. That thing kicked my ass too. Yeah. So I fought all these fish, haven't slept. And then we're on our way back in. And I'll never forget, we hook into this big blue marlin and like, and we, he was commercial fishing, so I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, are we going to sell this thing? He's like, no. 
But he's like, you could fight it. You probably never caught one. So I walk to the back and I see the line and it's peeling off. And the thing grabbed, he fished a lot of chewy hoos. So it was just rubber ballyhoo, you know, on tormentor heads and stuff like that. And I'm looking at the line peeling off. I'm looking at my hands. I'm looking at the line. <laughs> I'm looking at this marlin, beautiful and big. And I'm like, I've never caught one before. And I'm just, my body is hurting. And I'm just looking at this bull. And I just go like this with my hands. I go, boom, snap. I parted it right off. I said, I said I'll, I'll pay for the Lord, but just take me home. Only awesomest canyon trip ever, but only time I've ever been broken fishing. Like, I'm that last guy. I will stay and catch fish. You know, last man standing. I want, I had had enough. It's a whole different mindset with that, like, long of a trip and logistically intense trip. Oh, I mean, because we, I think at the end of the day, we had what, seven and the, uh, the, uh, Four big eye, like twenty something yellowfin. That's yeah, a, we were getting some big ones, like just you and, him. and two guys, just me and him. Fucking banner trip. That's yep. awesome. That sounds gross. My body hurts thinking about that. <laughs> <I> know, <right? laughs> and then the other times that I had been back with him, it was always like that. And he has like the craziest, oldest GPS you've ever seen. It's so old, but it's portable and it comes with him. And like you know, every certain, it was amazed me how. No matter what the canyon was, he knew the time of year and where he wanted to be at that point in time of day. It's a lot of time spent. It's crazy, dialed. Crazy super hours. dialed. Seems like it goes by his instincts, too, without even knowing this guy. Yeah. You know, he's not... I mean, I'm sure he follows, like, what other people are saying, but... It's funny because... goes by his gut. Yeah. I've been in the shop, and, like, you know, it's like he's someone that, like, Cookie will call. Yeah. And talk to him, like, because he's just out there all the time. Hmm. That's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, and that was it. And after that, I, w I wanted to go back all the time. In fact, it's funny because I don't really get to go out there as much as I'd like to these days. You know, now that I have a client that has a, a, a bigger sport fish and they like to fish the tri-state, and you know, they have a good time doing it. So that's about when I get to get out there. Yeah. So I'll do that and I'll help them with that boat. Do you fish any other, do you fish any tournaments with your own clients or is it pretty much like hop on whatever so, boat? Yeah. Or? I, I'll, I'll fish it just that one with my clients. I mean, you know, we used to do some of the shark tournaments and then like a lot of the local inshore stuff, like Fluke yeah. to your Puke, that was always the fun one. Yeah. You know, we got a we got a nice chunk of lunch money doing that. And, That's cool. Yeah. And there was always, like, I had done, before I was a full-time guide, I think I fished more tournaments. Now it's just tougher with the, the schedule. Yeah. Know? Yeah, we pretty much stopped doing tournaments. It's really difficult. You got to find the right client you know, that wants to put all the money in. And right. It's hard because you get people calling. And now I'm sure you guys get people that are booking like a year in advance. Yeah, I mean. You know, so it's like to do that. And then you don't even know when the tournament dates are. Yeah, I mean, especially it's, it's the tuna tournaments now with open and closed days. And they're like oh, doing windows and dialing in. Yeah, I mean, we may fish that, that one that happens in September now. The one that I think is going to be, I don't even remember the name of it, but it has... Way stations from Rhode Island up into yeah. Yeah. the Cape there. It'd be a cool one. You know, that, that one seemed like I, I have some clients that might want to do that. And it just you know, makes it a little more interesting. Yeah. A little more skin in the game. Definitely. What's, uh, what's you, one fish that you look back at and, like, you know it was either one of your biggest fish or maybe you've caught, you know, the biggest fish that you wanted to catch which i don't think any fisherman I has mean, had you, that happen you, you always want bigger i right. mean have you had one that like or maybe a couple that stick out that either you've lost or you've caught that you're like can't believe it happened yes i've had one that we caught that i couldn't believe it happened and then one that got away that i couldn't believe it happened perfect we can start with the one that got away yeah so we can end on the hero note but <laughs> <laughs> so you know it was early in my charter career you know, and I really wanted to get a bass over 60 pounds. I mean, that was like the goal. And obviously, I'm out bachelor party. Guys are drinking, having a good time, but we're catching fish. Now, when we're fishing, where I fish for stripers, a lot of it is daytime eeling, extremely light tackle to get bites because some of it is shallow water and you're 20 pound fluorocarbon. And before the circle hook law, I mean, it was tiny, tiny little hooks, 4 0 hooks. And, uh, we're at this spot where I had seen some bigger fish and we triple up. So we got two fish on and then one fish is screaming and I know it's a big one. So now I'm, I'm like, okay, I'm like, just take your time. 
you got the fish. It doesn't have you. Let me know when it gets closer to the boat so we can deal with it because he was on the opposite side because I had Tweedledee and Tweedledum. One's got a blue fish, one's got a small striper, and this is happening. So I'm like, yeah. oh, my God. All right. <laughs> so I'm really focused on these guys so they don't hurt themselves and I can just deal with this these shenanigans because I'm, I'm assuming it's going to take a lot longer yeah so he, i can hear him fighting the fish i hear drag going and then the drag kind of stops going so i know he's gaining but like i really like there is hooks and stuff and that's so i'm dealing with this and next thing i know i realize he's been quiet for like a long time i turn around to see the biggest striper i've ever seen it, it is massive but he's trying to boat flip it like oh, a largemouth. My God. So he gets just the head out of the water, and the line, before I can say stop, the line parts, right? And then the fish just kind of like does that stun thing where it's floating off the transom. And now I see it, and I, I don't have a net that's long enough, but I can see it, and it's, it's right there. And without even hesitating, I don't know what happened. I ran, and I <laughs> dove over the transom, and I got on top of it. And I have this thing now. It's in between my legs, and I'm wrestling it, and I have it. I am going to land this thing. When I, when it went, when I jumped on top of it and had it in my arms, it went from comatose to so pissed off. It spined me with that spine. It was wiggling, dude. I was getting poked like this, and I lost it. I couldn't get my hands around a gill or a mouth, and it squirmed away. Oh my god, that is an epic story. So that's two or three jump off the boat stories. Yeah, you're not scared of jumping off the boat. <laughs> No, apparently. No. I like the water. So how big, I mean, you may not even want to say it. How big do you think it actually was? Now that you've caught a lot of fish over 50 pound mark. 67 to 65 pounds, oh, somewhere in there. God. Yuck. Massive. That's a toad. It's the biggest one we've got on the boat was 62. So. That's a big fish. 62 is a fucking big That's one. insane, man. Yeah, it was, it was just. I don't like, think we've ever gotten on striped bass tackle. A 60 pound fish i know we've gotten close maybe right in that area on tuna tackle yeah trolling squid bars like a peak at hill and stuff yeah. and, and we had a few like 50s last year with that big biomass fish Bumper, nothing yeah. close to 60 though no their scales get bigger they look like tarpon scales you Do know they? you just can just see them that's like, so sick do you think a fish that big really only eats specific things or do you think they will eat anything I think they get tougher to fool, right? I mean, they've been around for a while, so, and they don't always have to eat because, I mean, you know, because they can eat easier because they are so big. It's like they could snack on like a three pound, four pound sea bass and be satisfied. And then, you know, if they don't want to eat, they're not going to eat, yeah. you yeah. know? Because hmm. yeah. I've noticed where it's like, I will see, we'll hook like a 35 pounder and when you reel it in you'll see a fish underneath it a bigger one that was trailing it that was yeah, curious we but had like, that happen once. why did he not eat you know what i mean he could have easily beat that other fish to the bait but he you know just wasn't yeah. fired up mm. yeah we had that one the river that i'll never forget that came up on the like 20 inch fish yeah 25 yeah. Inch we weren't fish. sure if it was trying to eat it or what it was trying that to was do. the like, biggest bass I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, because oh, yeah, I, yeah. I filleted big bass with small bass inside. Have you really? Oh, yeah. yeah. You know Twice. Who used, to, he used to do that, which is illegal to do, but... You say first names. Yeah. Just first names. The B, the B brothers from... Stanford. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They used to use very yeah. small striped bass in the canal. Yeah. And they have caught bass on the small bass. Yeah. They'll eat anything. Yeah, that's wild. I've yet to catch a giant with a bass in its stomach. Yeah, same. I've caught them with everything. Everything. Cod, haddock, hake, whiting, every dog normal fish. bait species, I know, dog fish. I know guys that have caught them using bass for bait. Yeah. You know. but I've never caught one with them in it. What, so, so that was your heartbreaker. What's your glory story? It was Cape Cod Bay fish, and it just was just the biggest asshole ever. 118 incher and literally we did everything we could and this fish was so smart it would just you know stay on the surface every time you would get anywhere close to it i would back down to it trying to get a shot it would change from going away and try to go at the boat and go like this and it would try to find the boat and it kept doing that over and over again you know so we're like crazy four four hours in which is unusual i mean most of the time i'm i I don't care how big the tuna is. It's like an hour fight. Like, yeah. you know, we're putting the drag up. But this thing, I mean, it was just like none other. It just would not give up. And 
finally I'm like, it's doing this thing. I was like, we're gonna take a chance. I'm gonna back up and then I'm not gonna move the boat away from it. I'm gonna wait till he tries to find it and I'm gonna harpoon him. So freaking he does that move again and he comes back. And every time it was black back when he was dude, this is back. like a mirror to that fish. Yeah. Yeah. That was a hundred and eighteen inch fish. Yeah. Though. And it's so he, he I was like, <clears throat> I'm just gonna stand my ground so I, I we got close to him he went to do it and i he was coming underneath and he was always coming like six to seven feet down so he comes under and it's black back and i just blind up and i just threw it and i stuck him and then i'm like all right i kind of spun around and he was on the surface and then he did this thing where he turned around and shook his head back and back 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 and parted the line and then proceeded to dump all of the harpoon line <laughs> and the polyball. So now it's going and we, we're trying to catch up to the thing. We didn't catch up to it till we were three miles from the, the bank. Mm -hmm. You know, so we had covered almost six miles and we're, I got, got the second harpoon ready and we're, we're getting close to it. You know, I'm just going like the bows pulling in the. Were you the, confident in your shot or were you like on pins and needles? I was confident, but you're never confident. Yeah. Because yeah. I'm like it black back and it's like I, I, I saw it stop, you yeah. know, but the handle, the problem was, is was under the water, the back of the handle when it hit. So I'm always worried about that because I didn't feel it. Like yeah, you, you, know, you always like the poke better because you know. Yeah. You feel the stop with your hand. Yeah. I didn't yeah. feel the stop. So I'm like, ah. Uh, and I'll never forget, we get alongside of this thing and it got him right in the back of the head. And he's still swimming on the surface with the harpoon just like this, like nothing happened. I get ready to get the second harpoon. We're going to take another shot at him. He started pulling to me and it just dies. He just died. Yeah. And we got him. And it was just like, wow. Was his heart hard or was his, do you remember if his heart was still beating? It when was you got still him? sort of beating still and it just like, I don't know what happened, but he just kind of. Just gave up gave and up. started going Pew. dude there's something once they get to that like 115 mark oh yeah it's like uh it's either gonna happen they're either just gonna croak and it's like tail wrapped like 20 right. minutes or it seems like it's just an unpredictable yeah. surface if you, shit show. if you don't break them right away you're you're yeah. in for it i mean one of the bigger ones we got with seth another 118 incher and was like a three hour one and i remember he was stable he was in pinwheels and stuff but like at like the two and a half hour mark i go over and i just push the drag all the way up and like everyone lou tabusco and seth are both like <gasps> and i'm like look it we just got to get him up like i we crimped this it's not gonna break just reel them in I, i'm and i remember i was screaming at lou i'm like dude you gotta put more hand like you gotta add hand pressure like yeah I, it's obviously the drag is not set enough <clears throat> and he was like holding it looking away like this but we we got him up and it's like that one, same thing. It was on the surface, but he settled in. Sometimes I feel like the deeper in the bay you get them, the more they do that crazy surface. I agree. Especially if you get them like in that 90 foot range. Like when they, yeah. the big ones go on top of the bank and they just like, they don't pinwheel. Like they get this like yeah. figure eight shit and like surface stuff. If they go off into the deep and they go down, you kind of like have a, a better chance. As soon as they're pinwheeling, you could hammer them with pressure. Yep. But the whole like chasing back down thing. This year we had a ton of like black back early shots and you seem to be aggressive watching your videos. I, similar boat handling, yeah, similar no, yeah. like that's on like, them. I think that's like my favorite part. Like yeah, I, yeah. it used to love to be on the reel and I I love throwing the dart, but I love driving. Yeah, totally. That's fun. I mean, you're catching the fish. I mean, the, the, yeah. yeah, you're catching the fish really. And it, it seems like too a lot of the fish that we got in Rhode Island are that bigger class. You know, they were. Mm. I would say a majority of the fish we got were over 105 yeah you know despite that 85 incher that was the smallest one we got hmm. all the tails that we got for commissions from rhode island guys this year are all paddles giant. yeah and most of them all have their bottom tip worn off like hard yeah. like they're like flat on the bottom from eating on the bottom on those it's, pogies for it's so funny long. i caught two fish this year that had no anal fin yeah it was missing believe it the red scuffs on their throat. They got like the regrowth on the bottom tip of their tail from just like grubbing all the time. And the, la the last one we got, I remember it had, it was in October and uh, I snuck out and we took actually some of my clients at Blackfish with me and uh, it was, had the biggest motor. I mean, I think the tail was actually bigger than the 118s we got and it was just 116 incher, but it was just like, you know, tip to tip. You're like, whoa. Sick. It is sick. 
<clears throat> um, do we want to do a piss break and then talk about charter fishing, or do we want to just roll right into it? I could take a quick leak. Is anyone yeah, else going to take like, a leak? Yeah, I mean, he's up here. I'm just leaving it on, and we'll be yeah. right back. Yeah. Oh. You, know, you know the questions we wanted to ask. George. Like Brian's peeing, George. Yeah, uh, George does the editing. Yeah, he does. We did it for a while, and then it just, it just, at the end of the day, a two-hour podcast takes eight hours to edit. Yeah. You know, you're, li- you're got to listen to it. You make the edits. You got to listen to it again. Make the edits. You put the ads in. Make the, you know, listen to it again, because you don't want to put something out there that's got one wrong thing in it. Just right. Totally screws you up. Like I said, we've said a few jokes on some of these that we bleep out. That like, if he didn't bleep it out. Oh yeah, that's right. Bad, People you know, out of the woodwork. But it's funny to listen to with them bleeped out, you know. So no, this is this is hilarious. I think people are gonna love this one. It's been going good, the podcast. I wish we could do it more during the season, like really keep it going, but I know. We try to front load them, like I think we're I think we have four or so ahead of you. Yep. And then you'll go out. And sometimes we'll we'll flip flop depending on like what's going on, you know. Like you in just the gotta figure out how to do one while you're on the ball, I know. on the ball hour. <laughs> it just it gets awkward with charters because you kind of want to yeah talk about like funny charter stories. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You know, true. Um, and like ninety percent of our charters are awesome. You know, Same. You get a few that like I've weeded just total those. knuckleheads. We did those out. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get enough business going, it. If I'd say it's like 5% or less that is just a pain in the ass. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, George, we're back. Um, charter fishing. Yes. A high school age kid wanting to get into this. Kind of like what advice do you have for the younger generation that's kind of trying to figure out like where they want to fit into the fishery, like the private boat thing, the charter right. thing, but specifically charter, what advice do you have? You know, you, you really got to like people and then you really got to study your discipline. Cause it's funny. Like if you think about like where I went compared to like my year class, like I'll look at like one of my buddies, John Galvin, right? We both worked at tackle shops at the same time, you know, and he went one route and went into the, you know, private sector. I mean, killing it too. It's awesome. Successful. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And then, you know, I went more as in like the, the work for yourself charter captain. Uh, when you're young, if you really want to be a charter captain, you have to fish with as many people as you can and learn as much as you can. Because a lot of how my techniques and everything evolved is from fishing and ha- being exposed to different fishermen, you know, and different, different ways of fishing, different types. You really have to live, breathe, and eat fishing. You know, and you have to like people. Yeah. You know, that's the biggest thing is you're going to have when you're first starting out, you don't know who your clients are and stuff like that. But, I mean, I would just say fish a lot. That that would help. And maybe if you want to do it, maybe go to like a diesel mechanic school or an outboard mechanic school because that will be, if you can do, the, like I work on my engine as much as possible, do all my fiberglass work, that will help you. In the long run, yeah. when you're starting out, because let me tell you, in the beginning, you're eating a lot of ramen. Yep. You know, and you're trying to get your bookings and, you know, but just expose yourself to as much fishing as possible. You know, it, if you want to be a captain, made on a, a party boat, made on a six pack boat, you know, see see where you kind of fit in. Mm-hmm. You know? What about... Um... What about from an entertainment perspective? Like, what's your approach with your customers? Oh, man, keep it keep it light and fun. You yeah. know what I mean? Even, in, and the one thing that I've learned is, like, you, you, it's all about the expectations and a lot of your energy is what's going to roll off. And, like, in the beginning, I was always so focused on, you know, trying to catch the biggest fish all the time, all the time, all the time. You have to not diminish the fact that, like, you know, you might have someone that's from, like, the Midwest and they might have caught this 27-inch striper. Meanwhile, you know, you really want to catch these 30-pounders and you're like, ah, we're just going to throw that back. But, like, no, like, read the room. Make sure, like, let's take some pictures of this fish. Like, celebrate that catch because even though I've seen a million of those fish, they may not have. Yeah. You know, so, and just keep it fun. You yeah. know, a lot of it is... I try to keep the techniques to stuff that keeps the client engaged and they're 
doing a lot of the fishing. And then I also think that keeping the tackle light to a degree, depend, like especially when you're bass fishing, keeps it fun. You know what I mean? When it comes to tuna fishing, that's a whole nother ball game. I, we're not really going to go the light tackle route because, you know, you get the guys that want to fish giants on stand up and it's like, well, we're not we're not there yet. Like, let's yeah. do a shark charter. Let me watch you fight this blue shark stand up and we'll go from there. And we'll discuss. That's right. Like, <laughs> you, have, visit that. you have to be vetted. But yeah. I, I try to keep it fun. You know, and just realize that, you know, at the end of the day, it is fishing. Yeah. But, yeah, that would be my advice is just get exposed to a lot of fishing as much as possible. Because it's funny. I mean, you just take things from all over. People that you've learned, things you do. I mm-hmm. mean, you know, I look at it in this weird cerebral way. Like, I will break down a pond that I'm going to go largemouth fish. And I'm like, you know, I got a thermometer out and wind direction. and That's well, that's what it takes. That's how you build your instincts. And then you yeah. recognize patterns, mm-hmm. whether it's, you know, you learn how to read water, just learning how to read. Like, it's amazing how many people like charters, obviously, because they don't go all the time. But like something as simple as like, you know, like a seam on a rip or, you know, you know, anything like that. Yeah. How many people just like don't understand how that. Yeah. how that all works, works. Just time and it water. comes from like like you're going fucking freshwater fishing after this and like yeah. just doing all those sorts of things you know and o- just always be willing to learn and apply things right and, you know you know and i was fortunate like when i came up and, and fishing like throughout my fishing career i mean i was lucky enough to meet people and be exposed to some really good captains you know that I kind of watched what they did too and learned a lot about, you know, how they were professional and, and how, you know, techniques that they use and just kind of blend it into your own style. You know, I mean, I don't think I've ever reinvented any type of wheel or anything like that, but you just kind of find out what works for you. And I will say the other thing about being a charter is having a program, something that you kind of like know how your day is like, you know, fishing obviously has variables and it can change in a heartbeat, but you still want to keep it somewhat organized and know that, especially for us because we do so many four-hour charters like i kind of have like i know what i'm going to target first and how much time i'm going to give it and knowing when it's not working to switch to a different species and then we can always come back to it you know yeah yeah having a game plan having a system keeping things simple keeping your tackle and even just like your daily morning prep and everything as systematic as you possibly can so it's the same every day you know. Yes, and having good tackle. I will say this because I've done a lot of charters where the tackle was subpar and it makes the experience subpar. I don't care if I feel like the person's going to drop my rod in the water. I still will give them the best equipment possible because mm-hmm. I feel like the overall experience is just better. Agreed. Because, you know. And keep your boat tidy. Yes. I can't tell you how many, <clears throat> and I'm sure you're the same. I mean, I've seen videos. You don't have like a yard sale cockpit by any means. No. But how many compliments that we get and how many returning customers we get just from having a clean ship. Yep. And I mean, it doesn't have to be spotless, right? right. It, it can work be beat up. Yeah. beat up means you're successful. But, usually. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Not, you don't want to have like all this tangled, rusty mass of yeah. books in there. And if I come back in and my boat looks like it's a yard sale, it's because it was a tough bite and I went through everything. Exactly. You know? You're washing every lure out of every box. I think one thing looking at like younger people coming in is, which is hard to find these days is the humble factor. Yeah. Um, it just seems like it's very hard to find younger kids that oh, Think about how much stay more humble. exposed to this crazy amounts of information I they know. have. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like, like when, when we were fishing and coming into fishing, like, you know, you would learned from people there was no youtube or anything so like you you would just get exposed to how it was like more like a mentor or someone like that or you would go out and try in things yourself yeah you know and sometimes you just get bombarded with all this technique stuff and it's like you know let's just slow it down why not just try instead of trying to learn them all quickly take one thing and try to just master that and then after you master that you know move on i mean that's kind of why i do like changing techniques and stuff like that or i like freshwater fishing because like some days i'm like I just, i'm gonna get better at doing this today you know yeah just incremental yep but take it take it slow and enjoy some of it too don't get so like you know put put the time in i think the mentor thing is big we haven't really talked about like we've talked about who you're influenced by just kind of through casual conversation in this but <clears throat> having a couple people when you're young that 
are your fishing mentors and mm-hmm. don't make YouTube your fishing mentor. Cause that's going to build your relationship skills in the charter world. Like, you know, you're used to fishing with different fishermen, how people like different things. You can kind of start to manage expectations through your mentors and then kind of pass that to your clients as well. Yeah. It just helps you, you know, helps your people skills basically. Right. Don't worry about the sponsors, the, all this and that. Yeah. Worry about honing your craft. Cause let me tell you, Things come when you're just good and you want to be an expert in your field. And the only way to be an expert in your field is to just practice and practice and practice mm-hmm. fish. You know what I mean? You just got to have so many hours. Like, I mean, I had already, before I even started doing bass charters, and I had already been bass fishing in Rhode Island and, and Southern Mass for, you know, years. Yeah. Years. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of newer charter guys that, and I get it because, like, you're right. trying to offset expenses exactly. and all that. But um, I think they need to practice a little more. Right, because what, yeah. what's going to happen is, like, let's just take, like, the small tuna fisher we have that's awesome right now. But, like, I know you two, we can all remember when it wasn't as easy. Right. So you really had to be on your game and knowing how to find, you know, read water do all those little things to produce those bites mm-hmm. you know there wasn't always just a ton of whales and a million fish on the, the backside you know yeah. it wasn't like that yeah. they were smaller pods and, and not as many so you know good times you got to be able to learn how to fish in good times and bad times and keep logs oh my gosh that is the one other thing write everything down even when you have the worst day ever that Those is probably the best. more important yeah. than the really good days yep. yeah you know i like, log everything yeah. i have that whole stack on my lower shelf right there just all logs from the every year yeah because you, know? you can go back and then you start to form patterns and then you'll start to make your own like decisions and then let me tell you you'll know that you can recall that hard day when it was like, oh man, we did this and it didn't work. So then maybe you'll try something else, you know, and, and yeah. just kind of figure that bite out. But yeah, recording your information. And recording, Jeez. and recording, uh, I mean, it's kind of sounds weird. It sounds weird to say, I guess, but like recording other people's information. Like if you're on, yeah. if you're on a spot and bite you have trends. buddies that are, yeah, bite trends, it's huge. Yeah, bite shut off, X, Y, Z spot, yep. turned on here. Yep. I always wind, look at the wind, like shitty change. days. It's like, that's when I'm like dialing in the moon phase, dialing in the wind. You know, what was the current doing that day? What was the bait supply like that day? And then you can kind of, you know, build it backwards, I guess. Yep. Um, being, and being a good teacher is huge. I mean, you yep. seem like just, you're very well spoken. Just, you know, this is my first time ever sitting down and talking to you. Yep. And, uh, you definitely have that kind of like teacher mentality. Like if you can get your clients every day to be a cohesive team, that's right. You're gonna fucking crush it no matter it. what yeah. you're doing, even if it's you know? a slow day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because look at it's fishing, but at the end of the day, if we're all on the same page and working together as a unit, and, yeah. and that's I feel like that that's my job is to make them, even if they have no experience, is by the end of the day have them be a better fisherman, fisherwoman. You know. Yep. You know, or if they have a ton of experience, then just kind of introduce them into the way I do things. Mm-hmm. And look, and sometimes if they have some experience and they want to try something, that's one thing. I will let them try it. I'll never say no. You know, yeah. if I th- I'm like, yeah, because what, what's it going to hurt? They're like, yeah. ah. I'm like, you know what? Let's try that. And, and if it works, you're going to learn. Like, exactly. Yeah. You know? Yep. Because you can always learn. Yep. I guess then the other thing, too, is if, if you are thinking about something like this and you know some good fishermen in a marina or something like that like go offer to wash their boat or something and try to introduce yourself yeah you know, and just the f- the f- the passionate free labor is like non-existent anymore at least in our oh, neck yeah. of the woods like the you'll get a kid for kids. you'll get a kid for like a day or two and then they fade off because there's a tuna bite and that's all they're concentrated on which i get and the passion is there but if you really want to kind of, I guess, climb the ladder quick, put, it's, some, time put some fucking time in, like show up, you know, buff the boat in the preseason, you know, doing all that stuff matters. Do the haddock trips, you know, cleanups afterwards. Oh, yeah. Like all, all the guys that I, I have that I fish with now, a lot of them, it's, it's funny. It's like the guys that I'm going to take when I'm going like commercial, if it's not a charter fishing and stuff like that, are guys that help me out like in the off season, you know, and put that time in there. Because if you can show some initiative, especially like if you were a young kid and like you're like, oh, you know, you need help doing this, doing that. 
you show up to help paint the bottom of the boat well you know all of a sudden i might need someone to come and like, you're gonna come with me you're on yeah. the list because you're gonna catch your 118 inch air and then bang yeah. yeah you know now you're on a friggin' well you know good reputable program and you've showed you know your work ethic i have one more question actually it's taylor's question i don't know if he's gonna remember it though it's a beard question oh about fishing reels oh oh have you ever caught your own beard in a fishing reel? Tons, all the time. <laughs> What's your worst uh, experience with that? Oh, man. Um, trying to clear a rod and like going like this on the 130 and then doubling up and then having this one in my hands go off and then having this get stuck <laughs> oh. in. <laughs> Did it pull hair off your head? Oh, yeah. Like how much? Uh, like I mean, it was a good old clump, you know. And I was just watching. It, it, it was that one was a. That's amazing. Uh, yep. Did you get the fish? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. that's good. Yep. And that's I've worth had, it. Would you lose a clump of hair every time you fish just to get a giant? Of course. Yeah. He's got enough. It to grows spare, back, dude. Yeah, grows back. Yep. yep. And I've had my beard get caught. Same thing. Actually, just moving a rod. In fact, that was the craziest thing ever. It was like Dom was pulling up to me so we could help him put a fish in and i'm like oh i gotta move the rod to the other side and like i'm i grab the rod and i got it like this and i'm kind of looking at him and then he goes look at your pogey and i look back and the pogey's on the surface and the fish just eats it and i'm just like (laughs) (laughs) when the line's coming off does how how's it grab it does it grab it and just like pull it through like one go on the the sides inside oh Oh, it's inside That was a sh- actually that day was a total shit show. He's right there. The freaking fish eats the bait. We ended up breaking the rod. As the rod broke, I threw the harpoon. We got the fish. <laughs> <laughs> that was wild. I had my sweatshirt uh, strings get hung in a reel. Yeah, that's happened a few times. <sighs> while like I was clearing a rod while we we're on, I'm like trying to talk to the yeah. customer. And my fucking head's like pinned to the one thirty. I take him out. From yeah. Now on. Yeah, and not so it gets caught there in re- in at Treated. at the end of the year. When I have, uh, like, take all the drags and service them, there's always hair in there. It's always spun up in my drags. You probably don't even realize it. And then when I'm snelling hooks for, like, togging or, or bass fishing, I tend to get, like, one little piece inside of the knot. Dude, it's like an extra scent. So that's what I say. I say this, you know, this is the extra lucky one. <laughs> oh, well, that was we, good. That was really good. We, we've been going over two hours of just magic. Um, if people want to book a trip with you, kind of i guess go through like we fish for x y and z at x time and all your information and all sure. that sort of thing yeah i mean if they want to book a trip definitely get on my website at nsfcharters.com and there's a link there to my phone number or i can just give you my phone number now to just call me at 978-877-0997 that's the best way to uh, get a hold of me uh the program kind of goes we start at the last week of April, and we go till December 15th, you know, generally we're fishing for blackfish from April till about mid-May. Right around Mother's Day, we'll transition. We'll still do some blackfish, but the stri- big striped bass are in. So from Mother's Day till August is when we're primarily striper fishing. You know, we get them good throughout that whole time. And we'll mix in that July through August tuna, tri- tuna trips, depending on the year and how it is. And I tell people, it's like, look at like the bite in Rhode Island Sound as far as tuna fishing, whether it's yellowfin or bluefin fluctuates. So, you know, if it's been good previous years, you know, we can book the day. But uh, I will always tell them if for whatever reason, it's just one of those years where they, they aren't in there, which has happened before. It's like, we'll we'll pivot and do something else or we can yeah. book it because I hate boat rides. Yeah, and, you know, same. Yep. And then tunas September primarily in yeah, October. Yeah, that's, that's all bluefin and that's giants. And that is kind of like, I have like a core group of clients that I like to take. But look at if you if you want to get into something like that, hit me up. We'll talk. I'll, I'll talk to you. We'll spend a little time on the boat, maybe do a half day bass charter. And if we get along and hit it off, then you can come bluefin fishing. Yeah. Because trust me, you want to like me as much as I like you if we got to spend 10 to 12 hours. I mean, look, it's some, 17. 17, <laughs> yeah, 17. That's true. Hey, I, I've I've had wives call the Coast Guard. Like, their husbands. <laughs> but yeah, it speaks to how hard you're willing to give it, though. Oh, know? yeah. That's that's no no stone left unturned here. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, th- Instagram, too, right? 
Yep. Yeah. And on Instagram. Yep. At, at Newport Sport Fishing Charters. Cool. Uh, awesome. We'll you link can all that. See us making out with some tug. Uh, that's going to be the video that we use for your promo for this, I think. The tog make out. Unbelievable. Well, thank you so much for doing this, man. No, this was, was great. It's awesome. It's been awesome out. to meet you. Yeah. Um, good luck fishing after this. Same with this. you guys. Yeah. I'll get on my. Uh, I'll get on my Onyx and show you a couple ponds that I haven't fished too much around here, but there's one pond I think you need to give a look before you leave. All right. So we'll talk, but we'll end this on our father's three words of fishing wisdom. Remember, you can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last one, you'll have to keep listening. Stay tight, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Seabros Fishing Podcast. If you would like more information about today's guest, our episode, and show sponsors, or if you want to order hats and apparel, please visit our website at seabrosfishing.com. You can also stay up to date in all the latest Seabros Fishing content and podcast episodes by following us on Instagram at Seabros Fishing. Finally, to book a trip with us through our family-run charter fishing company, please visit massbayguides.com or see our latest updates and fishing reports by following Mass Bay Guides on Instagram and Facebook.